Hello there, welcome to the Saray channel and welcome to my Omnibus series. I've got so many of these Omnibuses that are going to come out so that you'll be able to listen to an hour's worth of stories which I know you're going to love. You know, the thing is that telling stories is such a fine art and it's something that was practiced hundreds of years ago when people didn't have the technology that we have today. And everyone would gather around the fire and listen to a wonderful story. And also, what is so wonderful about a story is that, personally, I think it is the best way to go to sleep. Every night when I go to bed, I always listen to stories. And that's something that parents used to do with their children. It's something that they still do with their children. There's nothing better than a good story. And so I hope you're going to enjoy this series. And before we start, I just want to say, do subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss out on anything because I'm in for the long haul and I want to make sure that you get the most stunning stories to go to bed with at night or to listen to when you want to be one of those people sitting beside the fire and listening. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and let's get started. I hope you're going to enjoy the Omnibus. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I stood silently outside the abandoned, dingy, gloomy Queen Anne-style home, assimilating it all, as if I was drinking a flavoured milkshake, but regretfully this one did not taste good at all, for the bitterness on my tongue was very poignant. This piteous grey-blue house with red accents had a menacing, asymmetrical facade and dominant front-facing cable along with overhanging rounded eaves, a polygonal tower and a porch that covered the front facade. I felt as if this house was staring back at me, with invisible, foreboding, predatory eyes, for indeed if houses had personalities, this house did not have one at all. It seemed that charm had evaded and eluded it, giving it a wide, distant girth, and avoiding it like a contagious, deadly disease you did not want to contract. Yet this patronising house had an inflated, haughty ego, standing proud and tall with a snobbish, misguided sense of arrogance, self-importance and contempt. It seemed to consider itself to be superior, loftier and far more grandiose than other houses of its generation. Yet in truth it was in denial and repudiation for this once impressive house appeared to be dressed in rags like a bedraggled beggar on the street corner wearing scant threadbare clothing or the emperor who wore no clothes falsely believing he was dressed in resplendent finery when in fact he was wearing nothing at all for not to put too fine a point on it this house was quite literally falling apart it was dilapidated and in ruins then there were the unfortunates who had lived inside her suffocating, overbearing, uncongenial walls and had long since fled from her, as though the very sight of her made them nauseous and sick to the stomach. Then there were the rumours, too many of them to count, and, of course, all the idle speculation, and the respect of strangers who claimed to have heard disembodied voices, women screaming and random gunshots, along with others, who claimed to have been viciously assaulted by the unseen hands of an unfriendly demonical male spirit. It would seem many believed that loitering in this mansion during the pitch darkness of the twilight hours were the deceased spirits of former residents of this once affluent, sumptuous and extravagant abode that had made Raven Hall their home. Cold shivers went down my spine as I eyed the crumbling, decaying, decrepit mansion very warily. It really wasn't a pretty sight to behold. Truly it looked like a cantankerous angry man that wanted to be left well alone. Who would have ever been desirous or even remotely enthused to live in a place as cold, austere and stony-hearted as Raven Hall, even during those former days when it was in tip-top condition? You only had to glance at the place to feel that something about it wasn't right at all, even for a maverick like myself. I discerned even the double-hung windows with their highly flamboyant decorative trim, some boasting stained glass in shades of red, blue and green, looked rickety and unstable, and were covered in thick layers of dust 
that clung to the house like a congealed grease. Then I noticed the ugly vines that stretched out their grotesque tentacles that rambled untidily across the walls with an insatiable ravenous hunger, as if they wanted to take over the entire house with their green bounty and secure the shaking foundations with their thick, treacherous stems. What had I got myself into, I wondered. Why on earth had I agreed to do this nonsensical thing? I reflected over the evening when my friends had teased me mercilessly for my dismissive attitude towards anything paranormal. What was wrong with being an eternal cynic, or a lone wolf for that matter, in regards to my opinions? Someone that was a questioner that needed evidence to believe in anything outer-worldly. It was wise to be a sceptical and to challenge things that could not be explained, because I was certain that they probably could. It was easy to believe a ghost was floating up the stairs, when perhaps it was just some loose plumbing banging against the eaves of the house, or even a rat scuttling around in the roof. If that wasn't bad enough, my friends not only believed in ghosts, but in cryptid creatures like Bigfoot and the Skinwalker. Now I don't wish to be nasty or unkind, but the Skinwalker... Please! And as for Bigfoot, my guess is possibly a human hoaxer that was wearing a monkey suit that he hired from Universal Studios. Or the creature that you saw standing on its haunches that scared you half to death, that you willfully mistook for Bigfoot, was possibly just a bear. Much as I loved my friends, I certainly thought that they were misled and influenced by popular culture, believing what they wanted to believe rather than basing it on any sound evidence and genuine proof. I was not without guilt for relentlessly I had mocked them for their fictitious beliefs. Although I didn't want to be unkind or mean-spirited, it would seem that my manner had been somewhat abrasive and had provoked them all, including my wife, who certainly could not abide my cynicism and non-conformist attitude. She was desirous to shatter my delusions like a mirror into millions of tiny shards, for I had unintentionally reduced them to challenging my revolutionary belief system, or lack of belief, so to speak. So, you don't believe in haunted houses, Richard, scoffed Martin, one of our friends. Well, then, why don't you go and stay at the old McCarthy residence? Raven Hall, I believe its name is. We bet you won't be able to last the whole night there, because it's haunted. Mr. McCarthy hasn't sold Raven Hall yet, but he has a caretaker who looks after the grounds. He can let you stay in the house for a whole night. Are you willing to do it for us? Why would I want to stay in a house that is reputed to being haunted? I had piped. Of what point would there be in that? Well, chuckled my wife, who of course sided with all our friends on this occasion. If you really don't believe in ghosts... Why would you be at all adverse to staying in a haunted residence overnight? Why would it bother you at all, if you have absolutely nothing to fear? It would bother me because I don't want to stay in a large abandoned house all on my own. Of what purpose would it possibly serve? It's not a spurious ghost encounter that would creep me out, but I wouldn't enjoy the solitude and loneliness of the place. Good grief, said my friend Oliver. You can do better than that, surely. Nice try, though, Richard. But sorry, it's a lame, pathetic excuse that is completely invalid. If you don't believe in ghosts, then prove it. Humour us. Stay at the residence overnight and then tell us that you don't believe in the supernatural realm after your overnight stay at the hall. I tell you what, if you feel so lonely, I'll call Gareth, my friend, to join you. He's a doubting Thomas like you. You're both like two peas in a pod. You can stay overnight at the residence. Go on, be a sport. You know you want to, really. Very well, I said, if it makes you happy and to appease you as I'll never hear the end of it if I don't. I'll do it as long as I have company. And then they all cheered with delight. 
What had I got into, I thought, holding my backpack and plastic bag of takeaway food in my hand? Where was my companion for the night? And what about the caretaker? Everything seemed ominously quiet, and I certainly hoped it would stay that way, as then I would have the quintessential excuse to abandon this crazy experiment. Just as I was pondering upon these very thoughts, I could hear a lone car purring in the distance, driving down the long, smooth driveway that was surrounded by electric green countryside and clusters of very alluring red maple, oak and spruce trees that banded together to create vast areas of natural forest with open hiking trails that surrounded the left side of the home, where there was a distant backdrop of rugged outcrops in interesting shapes and rolling hills so typical of the bluegrass state. Finally, the car rolled up the driveway and did a very graceful U-turn, parking directly next to my car in a meticulous, perfect straight line. It was ironic. We both had exactly the same cars, two black BMW 5 Series parked side by side. I watched as the stranger climbed out of his BMW, glancing briefly at mine with a somewhat bewildered expression upon his face. I guessed he was thinking the very same thoughts that I had been. I was astonished to see the stranger bore an uncanny resemblance to myself. We even dressed alike. Perhaps the sceptic individual is one of a unique breed, much like a rare blood type with much in common. We were both of similar age, mid-thirties, about five foot six, lean athletic body types with heads of full curly black hair and an olive complexion that could get darker once exposed to too much sun. Some people falsely mistook me as being from Italian descent, and I'm sure this gentleman now approaching me had similar problems and was regularly confused for being Mediterranean. But nothing was further from the truth, well certainly for me, and I imagine for him too. I was a full-bodied, hot-blooded American through and through. Well, I like to think so anyway. I was exceedingly proud of my American heritage. Hello, said the man, coming up to me, shaking my hand warmly. I liked him already, for his handshake was firm. You must be Richard, he piped. You and I have been well and truly typecast for our free-thinking spirits, he joked. He stopped shortly for the moment, regarding the house, and I could sense by his reaction he was feeling it too. Don't like the house at all, he said, looking at me dubiously. I don't believe in ghosts, but if they did exist, this would be the quintessential home for them to reside. The place certainly gives me the creeps. My skin is crawling. Something about this place bothers me. I can't pinpoint it exactly what it is, but it's an unsettling, disquieting feeling. Have you actually seen the caretaker yet? he asked me. Not yet, I said. We have to wait for him to let us into the house. I'm secretly hoping he won't turn up, so we won't have to do this ridiculous experiment. And what for, anyway? Just to reaffirm to our friends that we still don't believe in ghosts. They are hell-bent on changing our minds. And come hell or high water, it's not going to happen. Oh, I agree with you, chuckled Gareth, giving me the high five. Even if I were to see a ghost, supposing they did exist, I'd never give them the satisfaction of saying, you were right and I was wrong. I can just imagine the satisfied smirks on their faces and the delighted yelps. We told you so. I know exactly what you mean, I said. I can already envisage the smug expressions on their faces, especially that infuriating wife of mine. And it's not going to pan out as they'd hoped anyway. <laughs> For a while, we stood perfectly still, almost motionless, surveying the house that held our immediate attention like a witch's magic spell. For as the ominous darkness swept over the valley... It was almost as if Raven Hall had become cloaked in a baleful, threatening, ethereal, inky blackness. I noticed that the adjacent towering oak trees very close to the house appeared to morph into tall, dark, menacing giants 
that swayed softly in the breeze. Their moving, shadowy branches appeared like ugly tentacles, only adding to the direful impression that enveloped the house in an inauspicious, pretentious aura. Something wasn't right about Raven Hall, but much like Gareth, I couldn't put my finger on exactly what it was that ultimately had confounded me. Then we saw him approaching us, and my heart sank. It was the caretaker. He was a man in his late sixties, with a full head of grey hair, and a magnificent matching beard. I wish I could grow one like that, I thought secretly. Good evening, gentlemen, he said, approaching us, and looking at us with curious concern brown eyes. In his hands he was jangling a large bunch of keys, and unconsciously selecting one decorative key for the very purposes of opening the front door. "'You rarely want to stay at Raven Hall,' he asked us, scrutinising our expressions carefully, as if searching for any signs of reluctance or hesitancy on our faces. "'You don't have to do this, you know,' he said. "'It's not a question of wanting to do it,' I said. "'It's more a question of proving something to our friends. "'It's all about making a point.' "'So you're cynics,' said the man, chuckling. "'You won't be for very long, once you've spent a night at Raven Hall, I assure you. "'If you make a whole night of it, of course, without running away. "'You do know about the history of the home?' "'No,' I said, shrugging my shoulders. "'Maybe you should enlighten us, because Raven Hall had certainly served to elevate my curiosity.' Well, in the 1900s, Raven Hall belonged to a man called Mr. Herbert Montgomery. He was a man of great means, not a good character, for he had a heart of stone and an eye for a beautiful woman. He married a very fair maiden called Charlotte, who came from an impoverished background, and he paid the family handsomely, if they would of course allow their daughter to marry him. Mr. Herbert Montgomery was abusive and controlling and impetuous towards poor Charlotte. He locked her away here at Raven Hall, as she wanted to escape from his cold-blooded clutches, but he didn't want to lose her under any circumstances. Charlotte's two brothers sent she was in trouble. They came to her rescue, as they hadn't heard from her for a long time, and had misgivings about Mr. Montgomery's dishonourable and pernicious reputation. They planned to steal Charlotte away from the property and return her to the safety of her home. Regretfully, they were caught at Raven Hall by the two vicious guard dogs on duty who gave the game away. Charlotte's brothers were caught red-handed, trying to rescue their sister. They were shot dead on the premises by Mr. Montgomery, who claimed it was an accident. Of course, he got away with it. Charlotte was so heartbroken by the demise of her beloved brothers, and became increasingly desperate to escape her violent oppressor, even if it meant paying the ultimate sacrifice and losing her life. She was very depressed at the time, as you can imagine, so she jumped to her death from one of the high windows here. I'm not sure which one it actually was, and frankly I'm glad I don't know. I gather Mr. Montgomery was so devastated about Charlotte's death that he shot himself in the head. He claimed he couldn't live without his love, for he loved her in a warped kind of way. Now it's believed you can hear gunshots in the mansion, and that men are chased off the premises, as Mr. Montgomery is still trapping Charlotte in the residence. Many claim to have heard the sounds of a woman's dreadful sobs. It's a very sad story, I admitted. Perhaps that's why the house has such a contemptible energy. Do you know why the previous owner vacated the property? asked Gareth curiously. Well, I gather it was the ghost of old Mr. Montgomery that made their lives a living hell, causing all kinds of pandemonium at Raven Hall. He spied on the young woman like a peeping Tom because he was renowned for being immoral in his life but we learnt the male homeowners were physically and violently attacked in the mansion. And you, I asked, do you believe in ghosts? Call me Jim, said the man. Put it this way, he said jovially. I wouldn't want to step foot into that mansion to find out, but I'm more than willing to open up Raven Hall for you. But I'm not the one that plans to stay the night here. 
Good luck. I think you're going to need it, sceptic or not. Lead the way, I said, and we followed him into the house and watched him place the key in the lock and vigorously turn it until it creaked open. We thanked the caretaker and cautiously entered Raven Hall. It was steeped in a pitch-black darkness, made a lot worse by the fact that it was no longer connected to the electric power grid. I opened my backpack and pulled out a couple of head torches, handing one to Gareth, who put it on gratefully. I've also brought along an oil lamp, he told me. We can use that too. As we entered the house, we were surprised to see that it was fully furnished, with ripped once opulent curtains framing the windows that had seen better days, while dust sheets covered the ornate, elegant furnishings, and the fancy wallpapered walls were now peeling and the once glamorous polished floorboards creaked as you walked, and were warped in places from damp, and appeared to be riddled with holes. If that wasn't enough, even the chandeliers had seen better days, as broken string crystals lay across the floor. And then there were the spider webs absolutely everywhere, some the largest webs that I've ever, ever seen, that were like wheels with spokes, their sticky silken fibres hanging from furnishings across doors and walls. If that wasn't bad enough, the carcasses of dead roaches were seen absolutely everywhere. It was not pleasant at all. We made our way to the main bedroom suite and climbed up the gloomy staircase that creaked and groaned under our weight as we ascended on each step. We pulled back the heavy dusty cover of the king-sized bed, both deciding that our sleeping bags would be placed side by side on the mattress that was surprisingly still quite comfortable. A small blessing, I suppose. My mouth felt dry and parched from the dust floating in the air that occasionally caused me to sneeze. <coughs> Bless you, said Gareth sympathetically. I think let's stay here in the bedroom suite and get this all over and done with to appease our friends. I don't know about you... But this place is too spooky to explore. And let's face it, the mansion is in such bad shape. It's a safety hazard. I'd rather stay put in one place. And at least this bedroom suite is devoid of mildew and rust. And the floor is in better shape than the other rooms in the house, which is an added bonus. I watched him as he lit up the oil lamp and pulled away the coverings of the side table to use as a stand and it certainly made a huge difference to be able to see more clearly in the dusky darkness. Let's have something to eat, I said opening up my bags of supplies that included a wide selection of sandwiches, cold chicken pieces, potatoes, salad and cold slaw, along with bottles of old-fashioned fizzy lemonade that I'd brought along with me, and of course a bottle of cold white wine that certainly served to take the edge of staying the night in such an oppressive, foreboding, inauspicious place like Raven Hall. It was about twelve o'clock when we retired to our sleeping bags, and before long I had drifted off into a sleep. Certainly the wine had helped. I awoke to find myself being shaken vigorously by Gareth, whose eyes were as round as saucers, and he looked terribly afraid. For someone who was more than a little scathing about the paranormal... He looked very discomposed and apprehensive, which was disturbing. "'What's wrong, bro?' I asked. "'Listen,' he said. "'Can you hear that?' I realised he was trembling violently and wobbling like a jelly, so I listened intently, and then I heard it. It was an indisputable sound. I could hear the sobbing of a woman. And it wasn't a disembodied sound at all. It sounded like a woman in the house was crying in distress. <laughs> Someone's in the house, I whispered. It must be a woman. Let's go and find her. I think she may have got in the house from the open front door. She's clearly in some kind of trouble. I think she needs our help. Gareth looked at me warily. I'm not sure that's a good idea. I didn't say anything to you, but I was awoken to the sound of gunshots earlier, and I nearly woke you then. How you slept through that commotion, I don't know, as the sound was ear-piercingly loud. Well, I am a deep sleeper, I confessed. Don't you see, said Gareth, it's exactly the sequence of events the caretaker warned us about. 
There has to be a practical explanation for everything, I said, looking bewildered. All of a sudden we could hear the clumping sound of metal-toed boots thumping up the staircase and moving directly towards our bedroom suite. We watched in horror as the half-ajar door of our bedroom creaked open very slowly, causing the hair on the back of my neck to stand up and my heart to almost miss a beat. The door was now wide open and there was no breeze to have caused the strange anomalous event to occur, nor any rational explanation whatsoever. The footsteps had stopped for a moment, but I sensed something and noticed that the temperature in the room dropped considerably and became icy cold, and now I was shivering with a measure of fear and great trepidation, and from the coldness that enveloped me like a blanket of ice, I was terrified. What the heck was going on? I truly wondered if we'd been set up by our friends, but then again, I wasn't too sure about that. Was something or someone standing in the doorway, I wondered? I certainly had the impression that there was, but I tried desperately to focus my eyes on the area, and even with the full light of the oil lamp still on, I could see nothing standing there. Yet I sensed a very ominous presence, and it felt as if someone very menacing and hostile was staring at us, almost like we were being stalked by an invisible predator. I perceived on a subconscious level that they weren't happy with our presence in this home. I briefly glanced at Gareth, and his eyes were focused on the doorway, and he was trembling in terror. I could smell the faint odour of a pungent cigar smoke and hear the feet walking towards the edge of the bed, and then the invisible eyes leering at us with a hatred that was unfathomable and I felt a strange tickle in my ear, and a disembodied whisper screaming, Get out! Get out of my house! in an enraged, deep, raspy voice of a man, and then I felt something pushing me violently, hard with a forceful pressure to ensure that I did move. I knew it wasn't Gareth, and it was all I could do to hurl myself down that staircase and get the hell out of Raven Hall with Gareth screaming at the top of his lungs behind me, Run! Run! It's following us! Neither of us had our car keys with us, and I glanced briefly over my shoulder to see this dark, spectral form running behind us that was the shape of a man, but black with no features, and I was consumed with absolute terror. We ran through those woods on a dark night, where the light of the moon was not generous, and it was exceedingly difficult to see ahead of us, most especially as we sprinted up the hiking trail that could potentially trip us up with tree-fall and unsuspecting rocks, but we didn't care. Then I remembered our headlamps that we were still wearing, even as we slept. Switch your headlamp on! I screamed out. It was so much better to be able to see ahead of us as we ran, but we could hear the heavy boots behind us, and then something grabbed hold of Gareth, and whatever it was, I saw nothing standing there, but Gareth was being beaten up by an unseen entity, and he was screaming and crying out in agony. I could see the effect of every punch, but nothing was there. It was terrifying to watch. Then the most extraordinary thing happened. I could hear something hefty thundering through the trees and bolting towards us. I became petrified, so much so that I wet my pants. Then I saw it, and in the light of my torch I could barely believe it. I was observing a Bigfoot, and I nearly passed out from shock, for this was not a man in an ape suit hired from Universal Studios, having a laugh at our expense. Nor was it one of my friends intentionally trying to prank us. No, this was the real deal. This creature towered at ten foot tall, and was easily four feet wide across the shoulder area, and a thousand pounds. I would describe him more like a wild man rather than an ape, but he was covered in hair that looked to be of a jet-black colour, but the muscle definition on this critter boggled my mind, as it was built like an army tank, made of dense, tight muscle, and yet he had the typical overlong arms and the pyramid-shaped head so often described in Bigfoot accounts, but the face on this thing was exceedingly human. Yet I did not smell the disgusting sulfurous compounds on the creature so often talked about, for he smelt as pleasant as the earth. 
The creature stopped as he observed the invisible struggle going on, but it was as if he could see what we were unable to detect, which was nothing short of astonishing. Perhaps the Bigfoot had extrasensory abilities, for it certainly seemed so. He let out the most horrifying roar that caused the ground to shake and vibrate, and he growled directly at the invisible entity, and appeared to be punching it into the fresh air with his overlong arms, even though we saw and observed nothing at all, but it appeared to be having a result. We heard the strange whooshing sound, and suddenly we saw this light orb floating away from us down a hiking trail back towards Raven Hall, and this invisible entity just vanished and disappeared from our sight. Gareth was no longer being attacked by this spectral being, which I am now convinced was Mr. Montgomery himself. The Bigfoot gestured for us to remain seated on the ground, and he made a few grunts, and like a centurion, he watched over us until the first light of the morning, and then he nodded at us and simply glided away. I sensed the Bigfoot creature had been protective towards us, but evasive and naturally reticent by nature. I assure you, even entering the house to retrieve our things was a scary business, but we hightailed it out of the house as fast as we could, with all our gear. We both speeded down the driveway at one hell of a speed, both agreeing to go to the local diner for breakfast together to discuss the previous night's events. A slim blonde waitress took our orders and I questioned Gareth about our strange experience. Do you still not believe in ghosts? I asked. Well, I have to now, don't I? said Gareth, pulling up his shirt to show me all the hand marks and punches over his body that had now formed blue and black bruises and clearly depicted very discernible finger marks. I could feel the ghostly entity of a man pounding me and beating me, and even the weight of him on me, but I couldn't see a thing. It was a weird experience, almost like I was being beaten up by fresh air, he told me. I think it must have been Mr Montgomery, still guarding over Charlotte. I imagine we posed a potential threat, I said. After all, he was a slime ball. "'and we are exceedingly good-looking.' "'And what about that Bigfoot?' piped Gareth. "'He was the real deal. "'You could see that he could see beyond the veil. "'How's that possible? "'I'm in no doubt about that. "'And he chose to protect us from that wicked entity. "'That was for sure. "'I mean, who would have imagined that Bigfoot was real? "'Frankly, I feel ashamed for... "'for ridiculing people in the past about it. "'I must say I am astounded. "'I can't get my head around it. "'Nothing for that matter. "'Everything seems nonsensical to me. "'I can't believe that there really is a supernatural realm. "'It's really going to have to make me consider my faith.' "'I began to cut at my bacon vigorously. "'You're not going to say anything to your friends, are you?' I asked. You're not going to give them the satisfaction of knowing that we were attacked by a ghost and, and saved by Bigfoot. Are you kidding, laughed Gareth. I'd never live it down. My lips are sealed, he said, making that zipped motion across his lips. I'll tell them nothing happened in that house, and there are no such things as ghosts. I don't want to dull my shining reputation as an ardent sceptic, do I? We both high-fived each other in agreement, for I couldn't bear the idea of eating humble pie. That would be awful. And have all my friends gloat over me with a told-you-so expression on their faces. So when I returned home, I promptly told them that there were no such things as ghosts, and my night spent at Raven Hall was very inactive, and they all were disappointed and astonished, but they never challenged me again. But then again, when subjects like Bigfoot or ghosts were discussed... Even the skinwalker was mentioned. I never said a thing. Maybe silence revealed my secret, as words were never spoken. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, He was glaring at me with his deep-set angry brown eyes, scrutinising me like a voucher perching on a tree branch, a scavenger, waiting for an opportunity to pounce and shred me to pieces, limb from limb with his powerful talons. I stood there in Mr Turner's office, my heart beating violently in my chest, 
so much so that I could feel the vibration, while my thin legs wobbled precariously, so much so that I almost lost my balance, like a real clumsy klutz. I could visualise the long leather belt he had used on me last time I'd been in trouble, and could envisage the brutal throbbing stinging sensation as he lashed my backside and the tortuous painful week that lay ahead of me as a result, when sitting down on my backside invariably became a hazardous problem, plagued by excruciating discomfort and extreme tenderness. Sit down, said the headmaster, pointing at the swivel white leather chair on the opposite side of his gleaming mahogany desk, and I obediently obeyed, my back perched up unnaturally straight, and my body sitting on the edge of the chair, while my feet tapped the wooden parquet floor very nervously, for I could sense that I was in big trouble. What had I done now, I wondered. I knew my miserable teacher, Miss Davies, was always reporting me to the head, like a big, fat, obnoxious, vengeful, tattletale tit, for she seemed to derive great pleasure from my being severely punished. I watched Mr. Turner with an engrossed interest as he pulled open a very stylish, elegant cigar tin, with pictures of horses in the mist of battle during the Civil War. He lifted out an expensive, chunky Cuban cigar in his thick, masculine fingers, which he lit up, and then he began to puff out a stream of quite pleasant-smelling aromatic smoke, and his tense, aggrieved face seemed to visibly begin to relax. "'What am I going to do with you, Clark?' he said, looking at me contemptuously. "'I'm getting rather tired of our regular little rendezvous in my office, "'and of perpetually lashing you with that leather belt of mine. "'Believe me, I derive no pleasure in corporate punishment of any kind, "'but it seems Miss Davies believes that lashings are the only thing "'to make you see sense and to put you firmly back in your place. I knew it, I thought angrily. That two-faced teacher of mine loved me being flogged. She always looked so thrilled when I'd been lashed. I might have known that she was the instigator behind it all. You seem to be the one student in Miss Davies' class that appears to be the root cause of all the problematic issues that arise. She informs me that you are rude, impudent, insolent, disrespectful and very cheeky during lessons. What do you have to say about that? It's not true, sir. I'm never ever discourteous to Miss Davies. I might play a few tricks from time to time, but I've never been deliberately audacious towards her, and that's a promise. I think you believe that playing the class clown is highly amusing, don't you, Clark? Now, I, for one, have never been against a good sense of humour, for it is an asset in a human being. But the problem is, Clark, you're disrupting classes and unsettling all the students who are here to learn, not to have a laugh at Miss Davy's expense, now, don't think I don't know about the stink bomb that went off in your classroom last Tuesday. Miss Davies informs me it meant that your whole class had to be evacuated for a couple of hours due to the odorous, revolting smell. I was also informed by Miss Davies that you were wholly responsible for placing a huge rat in her handbag that she opened up in class in front of the pupils and nearly had a coronary in the process when the rat bolted out of her handbag. I understand that everybody hooted with laughter. They clapped and cheered, leaving poor Miss Davies very humiliated and belittled by the incident. Now, what do you have to say about that, Clark? That's why she doesn't like me, sir. She wants to blame me for everything, sir, because everybody found the rat incident terribly funny. Oh, sir, you should have seen her face. It was hilarious. The rat nearly nipped her. You're not taking this seriously, Clark. What is your problem? You seem to think everything is a great big joke. 
I've been informed by some of the senior boys that you've been caught smoking in the corridors and you were observed doing truant during your history lesson with two other kids in your class having ice cream at the parlour over the road. Now you know that that is not allowed. No one is permitted to leave the school premises during school hours. It is highly unethical for you to do so. It would seem that you are a very bad influence on the boys in your class. And if this wrongdoing perpetuates any longer, I'm going to have to cordially ask you to leave the school for good. If Miss Davies had her way, you would have been long gone by now. You mean you're going to expel me, sir? I asked, looking mortified. You're not serious, are you, Mr Turner? I'm not that out of control. I told you, sir, Mrs Davies has it in for me. She doesn't like me at all. She knows for a fact that I wasn't even responsible for the stink bomb, but she wants to blame me for it. Anyway, what's wrong with a bit of fun, sir? Is that what you call it? A bit of fun, Clark? I assure you, if you continue down this reckless, rebellious path that you tend to be taking, I'm going to have to enforce disciplinary procedures against you, unless you change your ways. So if you want to stay in this school, you're going to have to grow up and to take responsibility instead of behaving like a complete imbecile. Mr Turner, I'm really sorry. I promise you I won't pull any stupid stunts again. But please, I beg you, don't expel me. I really like it here and I have so many friends. Well, I have spoken to both of your parents about this problem. I had a meeting with them in my office this morning and it would seem that they believe that you are as mischievous and out of control at home as you are on the school premises. This misconduct has got to stop. Do you understand? Now, I like you very much, Clark. I really do. But these shenanigans cannot keep happening. Do you understand? I nodded. I felt well and truly chastened, and I sheepishly hung my head in shame. Yes, sir, I said. I understand. I remember leaving Mr Turner's office in a state of shock, with feelings of remorse and self-incriminating regret. It was in the early 80s, and schools were very strict in those days, and took a very dim view of childlike pranks like mine. Also, smoking on the school premises could result in immediate expulsion, and I had broken those stringent rules dozens of times and got away with it. The idea of never being able to return to my school in Charleston, Virginia, was too dreadful to contemplate, but I knew that that spineless teacher of mine, Miss Davies, hated me with a fervent passion and would stop at nothing to get me expelled. At dinner that night, when the family gathered around the table to eat, my parents' disparaging eyes were both fixed upon me, and I could see by their grim, crestfallen expressions that they were far from pleased with me. "'Your mother and I spoke to your headmaster, Mr Turner, this morning,' said my father." looking at me with very condemning, reproving eyes. He informs me that you are an extremely bad influence at school these days and are wholly responsible for disrupting classes and making a great deal of fun out of the teacher, Miss Davies, who I gather is not eager for you to remain at the school. I can understand why she's not pleased with your deplorable, impish behaviour which has got to stop. Do you understand, son? No son of mine should go around the place behaving like a juvenile delinquent. Quite frankly, I'm very disappointed in you, son. Look at your two younger brothers. They never get into trouble. But you have become the embarrassment and disgrace in our family. I'm ashamed to have to say it. I nodded dolefully piling my plate with lots of potatoes and meatloaf, trying to ignore my father's judgmental outburst. Did you hear me, son? Or are you deliberately trying to ignore me? My father piped again. I'm extremely disheartened by your delinquency. 
both your mother and I are very disappointed in you. I also gather your grades are suffering and are badly affected because you fail to concentrate in class, which is an awful shame given that you are an exceedingly bright boy. Your mother and I have made a decision. It didn't come easy, I assure you, but we're sending you to Ireland for a month to stay with your great-aunt Margaret, as we believe she might nip you into shape. And it seems Mr Turner has approved our idea and has given us his blessing in regards to it. That isn't fair, piped my brother Michael. He goes to Ireland for being really naughty, and we have to stay here in Charleston, Virginia. It's not fair. It's like he's being rewarded for being really bad, and we're being punished for being really good. That's not right. Darling, said my mother, Clark is not going to have a good time in Ireland. I assure you of that, she said, looking at me with a look of smug satisfaction on her face that really rather reminded me of my spiteful teacher, Miss Davies. On the contrary, it's like he'll be going to boot camp. I'm afraid he's going to learn how to have to live an arduous, toilsome life, devoid of any privileges, and it may make him begin to appreciate his life here that he takes for granted. Your great-aunt Margaret was born in 1930. That's a long time ago. She left school when she was only 12 years old, so she never completed her education. The dear old lady lives in a remote 240-year-old Grade A cottage in Ireland, with no running water, television or electricity. Imagine that. And she's lived that way all her life, and doesn't even know how to use an electric kettle or electric iron. And some people describe her house as like a living museum. I do believe she is self-sufficient and bakes all her own bread and does everything the age-old way during a time when life wasn't easy. Your father and I believe Clark spending some time doing some back-breaking chores like milking the cow, collecting eggs and helping manage the affairs of Great Aunt Margaret's cottage might teach him to become a little less rebellious and more appreciative of life's privileges and blessings that he willfully takes for granted. So I assure you, sweetheart, Clark will not be having any fun at all. If Great Aunt May is a relative of ours, my brother asked, why did her family not come over to America during the potato famine, like the rest of our relatives all did? Well, your Great Aunt's side of the family were much more prosperous than we were. It helped that their prime crop was corn, which was abundant and highly profitable. So during a time when thousands died, they did rather well for themselves. Unfortunately, it was the potato crop that was damaged by a pestilence that they called blight. It was catastrophic for so many and was called the Great Hunger, from which thousands died. It was a tragic time in Irish history. So you mean there are lots of people like us in America with Irish lineage, my brother asked. Is that what you're saying? Of course that's what I'm saying, said my mother. Why do you think so many Americans celebrate St Patrick's Day? It's because of their Irish roots, she laughed. And so it was, without much say in the matter on my part, I took an international flight from America to Dublin and a fast train ride on Irish rail from Dublin to Kerry, and then a taxi took me directly to my Aunt Margaret's whimsical cottage. I wasn't excited about my visit to Ireland because my parents had warned me about the strenuous sapping and rigorous labour that I would be expected to do every day. I knew I was about to embrace a challenging month, collecting water from the well and baking in a pot oven over an open fire. Yet despite this, I did feel a stirring excitement as the train ride and taxi had exposed me to the ravishing views of picturesque Irish villages with their charming stone walls and cobbled houses and emerald green rolling hills, V-shaped valleys, rugged mountains, seaside cliffs, unusual rock formations and picturesque countryside scattered with grazing sheep, cows and horses. It was easy to see why Ireland is known as the Emerald Isle, as everything was spectacularly green and seemed so much smaller and contained than America, 
yet quaint and charming all at the same time. Finally, the cheerful taxi driver dropped me off at a quaint-looking rustic cottage, which was a fine example of vernacular architecture, as houses in those bygone days were built with the help of both family and friends. They were usually made out of rubble, stone, rocks or even mud, and covered with rough mortar to keep them dry. The walls were also whitened in a lime wash or coloured in tints that used powdered brick, stone or even cow urine to create a rich earthy colour. The roofs were also layered with straw bundles secured with ropes in a process known as thatching. And I noted on my train journey many country homes still possess this quintessential poetic and magical rustic charm. No wonder this was the land of fairies and goblins, for their essence seemed so befitting in such a mystical, prepossessing place. My great-aunt Margaret's whimsical cottage was utterly charming and incredibly pretty, and I understand it was made from stone and covered in a mixture of cow manure and pig's blood with a white lime wash that made the wall look incredibly white, along with a thatched roof and vintage green wooden panelled windows and a bright green front door. On every window was a window box bursting with bright, colourful hanging geraniums in pinks, purples, reds and whites. I noted she had a neat little white gate and a three-foot stone wall that surrounded her property that overlooked a beguiling, bedazzling and panoramic backdrop of mountainous views. When I arrived at Aunt Margaret's cottage, it was hard to fathom that she lived in such a primitive, unsophisticated way, much like they did in the 1800s, where water was collected at the well, while all the dairy products like milk, cream cheese and yoghurt were made from the cow. And she also canned all her food while she raised her own chickens and grew all her own vegetables in the backyard. I'd expected to feel rather intimidated and overwhelmed by all the chores that I would be expected to accomplish, but instead I was intrigued and enamoured by this brand new lifestyle, so far removed from my own as it really was like taking a trip in a time traveller's machine and experiencing life in another age, and that, for me, was completely fascinating. I liked my great-aunt Margaret very much, as she had a warm, lively Irish accent and a remarkably good sense of humour, and she was not the punishing disciplinarian that I'd expected her to be. Instead, she was one of the most interesting, convivial people that I've ever met, with a generous, kind heart. I was surprised to discover that her only source of entertainment was a wind-up radio, which we would listen to at night and in the morning when we turned in to the local news or the BBC World Service. My aunt's cottage consisted of about five rooms, but my favourite room in her entire house was her cosy kitchen, which she always referred to as the heart of her home. This was where she kept a fire going both day and night. On one side of the room was the largest Welsh dresser, that I've ever seen, covered in blue and white china, from large cauldrons to jugs and cups and saucers and plates, while on the other side of the kitchen was a wall of books that went on for ever and ever, and a scattering of well-appointed upholstered chairs. And on the far side of the kitchen was a large wooden table with chairs that overlooked the most magnificent views of the countryside. Next to the fireplace my aunt had a neat gas hob, where she would boil her kettle, and a workstation and a tapless sink for preparing and chopping her vegetables. I was to discover that most of her cooking, especially the baking of bread, was procured in a large cast-iron pot, with a lid where the coals were placed on it to distribute the heat evenly, and the bread that was produced on those open flames was the most delicious bread that I've ever tasted in my life or since." My aunt had two types of flat irons that she would place on the embers to get hot in order to do her ironing, and they were so much more efficient to use than our modern-day irons, which came as a surprise to me. Every morning I would rise up early, when there was a cold chill in the air, and I was expected to get water from the well with a large bucket, and to chop firewood with an axe, and I found these jobs almost therapeutic and meditational. Later I'd milk the cow Matilda, who was a friendly, docile creature, and I enjoyed milking her by hand and learning to make all that butter and cheese. I would spend copious amounts of time in the backyard collecting vegetables and digging up the rich, fertile earth. 
in truth, rather than finding my life in Ireland to be a chore and a laborious amount of hard work, I seriously enjoyed every minute of it, as it made me feel productive and accomplished, and I'd never felt useful like that before a single day in my life. It really felt as if I finally had a purpose. One night, when the cosy oil lamps were lit, illuminating the cheerful bright kitchen in a soft glow, and we were cuddled up in our comfortable chairs by the homely fire, my great-aunt Margaret asked if I'd seen the wild man yet, and I was startled by such an extraordinary random question, for I couldn't fathom what she was talking about, and was exceedingly perplexed. "'The wild man,' I said, looking surprised. "'What wild man? I don't know what you're talking about.' "'You live in West Virginia, don't you?' she said. "'Well, I'm talking about the wild men that inhabit the forests there. "'I've heard all about their kind, from a cousin of mine who lived there. "'Sorry, Aunt Margaret, but I live in Charleston. "'It's a neighbourhood, which is not exactly in the countryside, "'but I've never, ever heard of the wild man before. "'I really don't know what you're on about.' "'Aunt Margaret pulled out a shoebox of letters and quickly fanned through them. Then finally she opened up an envelope and retrieved an old letter. This was written by my cousin Walter in 1952, she told me, and I'll read it to you. And this is the letter she read me. Dearest Cousin Margaret, I wish I could be writing to you under the umbrella of brighter, more cheerful circumstances, but it is with great regret that I have to inform you of the calamitous death of my brother Connor who tragically, we believe, passed away on the 2nd of July in the most baffling state of affairs that for a while left us completely perturbed and very confounded, as we could not conceive of what had become of him and how he had met his inexplicable end. It is with a measure of great regret, I am afraid, that I was to see with my own eyes the predatory monster that I am in no doubt was responsible for his heinous, untimely demise that has shaken us all to the core. It all began when Connor and I went fishing by the lake Tuesday last. I do remember it was an exquisitely beautiful day, as this season in West Virginia is the first time we almost jumped from winter straight into summer faster than a jack rabbit, and it seemed that spring only made a very fleeting appearance. On this occasion Connor and I left the farmhouse before the sun even rose over the escarpment and it was still ominously dark outside, but neither of us minded that. We're fortunate enough to live in a remote area, with a scattering of pretty farmhouses here and there, and ubiquitous areas of luxuriant thick forest, along with lots of remote country roads and hiking trails. The Silvery Lake is spectacular to behold, and a prime bird-watching location, where I've seen phenomenal bird life from time to time, including a rare sighting of the elusive Golden Eagle, on several occasions, I might add. The lake is only half an hour's very pleasant walk away from our property, and you access it through a large open trail in a densely wooded area of mature-looking red maples, pines, sycamores and oaks. So armed with our fishing tackle, we ventured towards our favourite fishing location, as the lake is heavily stocked with fish, and when the dawn broke, we could see it was going to be a fine, very agreeable day. And under the large canopy of weeping willows that surrounded the lake, we had plenty of cover, should it become too hot later on. We planned to make a day of this sporting adventure of ours, for at lunchtime my wife would deliver us a basket for a picnic lunch, along with delicious homemade bottles of her tangy lemonade. We eagerly cast out our rods and began to fish, and after a while the hair on the back of my neck began to stand on edge, and I had this horrible sense that we were being watched by a pair of monacious predatory eyes, and I was convinced that we were being surreptitiously stalked as well. It was almost how I imagine a deer might feel, when it senses a predator is around. That's how I felt. I asked Connor if he felt as if we were being scrutinised, and he told me that he felt nothing of the kind at all, and that my imagination must be playing tricks on me, but I was not so sure. I put down my rod, telling Connor I was going off to relieve myself, but I lied. In truth, I just wanted to look behind all the trees facing the lake, to discern if I could find anything stalking us, because I had become rather paranoid that something appeared to be spying on us. 
I had no weapon with me, but I took a sizable piece of timber to chase off any animal loitering around the immediate area. All of a sudden I heard Connor screaming at the top of his lungs, Help! Help! Please, no! Help! Help! I've never heard him cry out like that before. His cries were desperate and frantic, and I felt a ghastly chill running down my spine, and I instinctively guessed that something dreadful was wrong. I quickly ran to the lake as fast as I could, but the sound of Connor's screams began to fade and dissipate, as if he was now far away from the lake. It was almost like his screams had become ethereal and ghost-like, until they could finally be heard no more. I began to search for him, but I couldn't find him anywhere, and I was absolutely devastated. I did, however, discern two huge footprints belonging to a man of gargantuan proportions, for the foot size in the mud must have at least measured sixteen inches. Now that's very big. At the time, I reached the conclusion that my brother may have indeed been abducted or killed by a villainous man with very large feet. A search party was naturally orchestrated, with over a hundred men looking for my brother, but no one found anything, as it seemed as if my brother had literally vanished off the face of the earth, with only his fishing tackle still remaining intact. Two days later, a man venturing close to the lake discovered a man's arm lying under a bramble bush, a hundred feet away from the lake. I recognised it as my brother's arm, and based on this evidence, we knew he was deceased. It looked like my brother's arm had been just ripped off his body, which the coroner believed would have taken extreme strength to accomplish. Unfortunately, the rest of his body was never found, so we were only able to bury his arm under his headstone, which was very distressing for us, especially for Mother. As you can imagine, my parents were inconsolable with grief, and not knowing what had happened to my brother caused us the greatest distress of all. I returned to my fishing spot a week later, because fishing has always made me feel very calm and relaxed, and I wasn't about to give it up, despite what had happened. My mother wasn't altogether happy about me returning to the scene of the crime, so to speak, but you cannot live your life consumed by fear, can you? I'd been fishing for over two hours and had caught several fish, when all of a sudden I heard a human scream, and it was so close to my fishing spot that I cautiously decided to follow the source of that strange noise, which in hindsight was not a wise decision on my part to make. At first glance through my binoculars, I spotted this very powerful human-like silhouette gliding through the trees, and it was built like a gargantuan giant with overlong arms that hung beyond the knees with pronounced shoulders and a straight, burly, muscular back that was covered in four-inch thick black hair from head to foot. This outlandish being moved like thunder through the trees at a lightningly fast speed, with grace and agility uncommon for something of such ample proportions. My blood turned as cold as ice, and my stomach twisted into hundreds of knots, when over his shoulders I discerned that he carried the body of a man, a man that I am well acquainted with, his name is Chris Hoggins, and this thing pinned him down with just one large hand, and the man kept screaming, Help! 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 It really reminded me of what had happened to my brother. I quickly followed behind as fast as I possibly could, with every ounce of energy that I had, struggling to keep up with this creature's incredibly fast pace, for I do not exaggerate when I say that with every stride this creature took, it was possibly equivalent to five of my own feet, and this creature wasn't even in a hurry. I do not know why I kept running, but I just did, and it's very fortunate that I am a fast runner. Anyway, I saw this monstrous creature climbing up the mountainous ridge with Chris Hoggins balanced over his shoulders like a sack of potatoes. Unfortunately, I slipped on a branch and made a loud cracking sound, and the hairy humanoid turned around to glance in my direction, but I remained very still behind the tree, not daring to move a muscle. I've never been so afraid in all my life as I was then. I was sweating like a pig and wobbling like a violent jelly. The creature's face focused on the tree, my tree, exactly the tree where I was hiding, but I don't think he saw me at all. But that was when I discerned the face that was so human but leathery-looking, 
It was a dark red tan colour that rather reminded me of those indigenous Indian tribes. I watched the creature climb the most rugged mountainous ridge like a mountain goat, and then he just disappeared into the mountain, so I imagine that there must have been a cave up there. Of course, the mountainous ridge isn't accessible to humans, as it would be far too treacherous for us to climb, without professional climbing equipment, that is. But this thing made light work of it. I quickly went to Chris Hoggins's wife and told her what I'd actually seen and warned her that her husband may have met a deadly fate, and she was appalled and horrified at my haunting revelations. So naturally we called the sheriff. When we went to the woods with some police backup and a couple of professional climbers who were going to attempt climbing the mountainous ridge to find the mysterious cave in the hope of finding Chris Hoggins. Imagine our surprise when we found him wandering around the woods in a trance-like daze. In fact, he was so disorientated and confused, he didn't even recognise his own wife. And three weeks on, he has no memory of what happened that day, when I saw him being abducted by that giant-like humanoid. The circumstances were indeed exceedingly bizarre and peculiarly strange, and I still can't make sense of any of it. I consulted an indigenous Indian called Abixigan, which means wild cat, who knows the area exceedingly well, and has lived in this part of the world all his life. He informed me that there are wild men living in the woods of West Virginia, and assured me that they are usually benign, benevolent and elusive, but have lived in our forests for many generations, but usually remain unseen to most of us. He was of the view that many would rescue a human in distress, should they be in trouble. He said the elders in his tribe respected and revered the wild men so very much and considered them to be the quintessential guardians of the forest. So in homage to them, and in a gesture of thanksgiving, they would leave baskets of fruit for them to ensure a rich harvest that year. He was of the staunch opinion that there are indeed rogue wild men, rather like the bad apple in the family, who's capable of abysmal acts of violence. I believe it was one of those rogue wild men that killed my brother, but I have no idea why the other man escaped with his life and has no memory of the event. I'm determined to seek this wild man out and kill him myself, but I regret to tell you that that is unlikely to ever happen based on how evasive these beings actually are. I'm sorry to have to break such sad news to you over my brother's passing. I know the two of you were very good friends indeed, so it is with great sorrow I have to inform you of his demise. My father and mother both send you their love and very best wishes. Fondest love, Cousin Walter. I watched as Great Aunt Margaret's eyes suddenly filled with tears that poured down her pale skin like raindrops. He was a good man, Connor, she said. I'm sorry to blubber. Don't be sorry, Aunt Margaret, I said. That was a terrible thing to happen, but the wild man you talk about, I've never heard of them before. I spent the rest of the month with Aunt Margaret, and together we had a wonderful time in Ireland, talking and laughing. I met many of the eccentric local residents in the area, and was told so many mysterious stories of people's erroneous encounters with the Fae, which many believe are not just legendary, but very real. I continued to work hard, living in the old way, and I didn't find myself longing for an electric kettle, nor for a television. Instead, I grew closer to nature, and my life became richer and more meaningful than it has ever been. I assure you, it was almost a disappointment to return to the modern-day conveniences of everyday life, as there was something so magical and rewarding about being self-sufficient. Of course, when I did return home, both of my parents were bitterly disappointed that I'd enjoyed myself so much on my Irish trip, and my brothers were terribly jealous. But they were to realise it had indeed been the making of me, as my view of the world had completely shifted, and when I returned to school, I truly became a model pupil. I am afraid Miss Davies continued to absolutely hate my guts, and looked for any excuse she could to send me to the headmaster's office for a big lashing. I think Mr Turner realised what was going on, and had discerned that the vicious Miss Davies wanted revenge because she could not forgive me for the rat incident. He told me to act like I was in agony, 
and to pretend that I had been beaten within an inch of my life. I even drew some bright red welts on my bum to satisfy Miss Davies, who looked thrilled when I pretended to be in absolute agony. I remember her surreptitiously glancing at the painted wheels on my bum that I was showing my classmates, and looking as pleased as punch. It did seem that she was completely taken in by my clever act, but I did lay it on very thick. It was only years later I was to discover that the letter Great Aunt Margaret read to me was describing the mythical creature called Bigfoot, but I still wonder whether that creature was responsible for Connor's untimely death. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I had been trapped and isolated in the torrent tower room of our Queen Anne-style home for over two years. It had become my refuge, my prudent sanctuary, my safe place to shelter and shield myself from the dangers and hazards of the big bad world, like a large bubble of protection that enveloped me in a seal of security. Even the rest of my house was like a field of landmines, potentially explosive and completely terrifying, where the enemy could be lurking and hiding out behind the sofas or in our large pantry in the kitchen, ready to launch a full-scale attack upon me, as I had personalised my fear, and it certainly felt like the battle of me against the entire world. I was like the quintessential circumspect princess, tucked away in a misanthropic castle with my tiny joyful companion, a Yorkshire terrier called Bundles for company. My parents and siblings visited my room daily and brought me all my meals like a fast food delivery service. I refused to step away from the unassailable confines of my own impregnable fortress, causing my family an overwhelming amount of grief and anxiety as a result. They pondered as to what to do about my current situation and dilemma, for my enigmatic incongruous behaviour perplexed them greatly, leaving them with feelings of hopelessness and despair, for no one should be entombed in their bedroom for ever. How had it come to this, I wondered. A while ago I would have laughed at the mere idea that I was ever live a stifling, claustrophobic and contained life like this, constricted to a small space like a string of pearls, relegated to its jewellery box, never ever to see the light of day again, or like a deep-sea fish, strangled in a net of its own making. I would never have envisaged such a limited future for myself and certainly have contemplated the sanity of such a person that was too afraid to leave the perimeters of their own bedroom as bordering on the completely insane and irrational. Indeed, I had heard of such eccentric people before, suffering from this debilitating psychological condition with very little sympathy. For indeed, an incommodious life without any challenges was no life at all as far as I was concerned. It would seem that running away from your life was like hiding away from living life to the fullest. Now the person that I had little sympathy for was myself, and being on the other side of the fence made me see things in a whole new stance. It would seem that fear ruled my life with a ruthless iron rod and had held me hostage and prisoner in my own bedroom. But I was the judge, jury and executioner that had laid down the penalties, delivering a stiff sentence to myself of perpetual isolation and seclusion from the world. My life appeared to offer me so much potential. Well, that was me at one time, but not any more. It was just one day when things transformed in an instant for me, like clear sunny weather suddenly overcome by looming dark thunderclouds and threatening jagged yellow lightning flashing across the sky and in seconds the clouds burst open and the thunder rumbled, thrashed and boomed, and before you knew it, you were caught up in a storm, vulnerable, wet and very exposed. It was exactly like that for me. It was like a brief second of time when my life collapsed and disintegrated like a crumbling, dilapidated building, never to be the same again. How I wished I could turn back the clock and undo that time again, for I would have done everything so differently and never left the house at 11pm that Saturday morning when the precarious hands of fate would blow my world wide apart. It had all started out like any normal day, 
probably better than most, for the long drawn out winter of freezing, repetitive cold days was behind us, and this was the first real glorious day of summer. There was an upbeat, vibrant enthusiasm in the air, which was very contagious, where people discarded their heavy coats and gloves to the back of the wardrobe and brought out their light cotton cool summer clothes. I was excited to dive into my yellow dress with its white pattern of daisies on the cool, pretty fabric that I'd been longing to wear for quite some time. Don't you look magnificent, said my mother coming into my bedroom. Oh, go on, girl, give me a twirl. I love that yellow colour on you. It's spectacular, she said. You look so vibrant. It reminds me of the fashion in the 60s. You just need a pair of white boots and you'll look the part. You'll certainly make all your friends look very dull and drab, showing up in that stunner, I assure you of that. So you like the dress, I asked her, looking very pleased. I must say I do like the material. It rather reminds me of spring. Love it, I adore it, sweetheart, piped my mother. You look incredible. My father entered my bedroom with a huge beam on his face. Oh, my word, he said. You look amazing. Where are you going, sweetheart? I'm going for brunch up the road with some of my friends from the university. Don't eat too much, my mother teased. I've invited the Sullivans over to dinner this evening and I'm laying out a great spread. We're having cob salad, tater tots, pot roast and roasted vegetables, mashed potatoes, plenty of gravy and mac and cheese, followed by your favourite key lime pie. Well, I wouldn't miss it for the world, I teased. It sounds so yummy. All of a sudden, my older brother and younger sister entered the room. You look a million dollars, said Cordelia, gasping as she admired my dress. Oh, I hope you'll lend it to me. That dress is gorgeous. I agree, teased my brother. You do look a million dollars. Thanks, I said, my cheeks flushing crimson from all the compliments as my family members gathered around me as though they were admiring the stylish mannequins in a clothes shop window. I was in my early twenties at the time, studying medicine at university. I walked down the stone steps of our burgundy-coloured Victorian house, feeling on top of the world, boosted by the unexpected compliments doled out generously by my family members, who were not inclined to ever be effusive. I glanced briefly at my wristwatch. It was eleven o'clock, a little early perhaps, but I was enjoying walking down the streets with the radiant beams of blissful sunshine soaking my body in a pleasurable warmth. I had all the time in the world, so I decided to enjoy a leisurely stroll down the tree-lined streets of Toronto, where I was going to meet up with my other girlfriends at the local cafe for a friendly brunch. I was looking very forward to it. In a trice the world changed. It took possibly a second, and no more, but much can happen in a second. I could hear a car speeding down the tarmac of the street unnaturally fast, and the tyres squeaked and squawked. No one should drive at an outrageous speed in a residential area, surely, I thought fleetingly. I mean, it was asking for trouble. It was inviting an accident, like an unwanted guest to a dinner party, that you would sooner rather avoid. One moment the road appeared wide open and safe, and then this black Buick seemed to be spinning out of control and somersaulting in the air before me, while bodies that looked like flimsy, delicate china dolls were flung out of the open windows, smashing to the ground like boiled eggs. For a moment, time stood still. And then there was an earth-shattering noise, the crunching, the crashing, smashing sounds of metal, crumbling and folding and hitting the ground violently with a powerful force, and an acrid smell was unleashed into the atmosphere that was very nasty. It was like a scene of great carnage. All of a sudden, rolling towards me like a soccer ball in a stadium, was the decapitated head of the driver, a young man of a mere twenty-one years old. It rolled towards me, stopped stationary at my feet, and the vacant brown eye stared back at me from the glazed sockets. I began to scream and scream. I discerned body parts scattered over the road that included a single foot dangling from the jagged metal of the car and a mangled hand caught up under the wheel. 
while the grey granular tarmac was spattered with blood, congealed fat, bone and brain matter. It was a horrendous scene that no one should ever have to witness. While my body for a moment seemed to be disabled by a paralysing fear. Was I dreaming, I wondered, but I realised I was very much awake. I was witnessing something that was real, inflamed, raw and tortuous, and it was unfolding before my eyes like the most horrifying movie that I'd ever watched. I dashed over to the neighbour's bush and began to hurl up the contents of my stomach in disgusted revulsion. In a trice the streets were lined with people that emerged from every nook and cranny like hundreds of rabbits scurrying out of their burrows. The residents hovered around the accident scene like frantic bees in a desperate frenzy, while police were pushing the gawking onlookers away. Get out of the way! Get out of the way, please, everybody! Just get back! Get back! The emergency services are here! Now get back! Get back! Ambulances with their ear-piercing sirens arrived on the scene in seconds, with EMTs rushing towards the victims of the tragedies with their trolleys, and the flashing blue and red lights of emergency vehicles were absolutely everywhere. Tragically, there were no survivors in this perilous accident, as no one was wearing a safety belt. The young driver had been showing off his bedazzling brand-new car he'd received from his parents as a birthday present, showing it off to his friends by driving at a very fast speed. His car was a 1985 Buick Electra and was now just a mangled piece of metal. I witnessed bodies strewn on gurneys, wrapped up in body bags and being placed in the back of emergency vehicles. You could feel the air was saturated and impregnated with a heavy oppressive energy of a great underlying sadness and grievous disappointment that no one's life could be saved or spared. Dreadful accident, said one officer to another. Why they weren't wearing their safety belts? It beats me. Youngsters these days, they probably think they're invincible. You know, kids that think they'll live forever. Even so, said the other officer, driving at such a speed in a residential area is crazy. It's called showing off to your friends, came the reply. Why do parents do it? Buy their kids such expensive, extravagant, deadly gifts for their birthdays. A car in the wrong hands can be as lethal and as hazardous as a missile. In the end, it would seem I was the only live victim from the scene of the accident. But my injuries were the invisible kind that are indelibly marked on your psyche, never to be forgotten. I was hospitalised for several days, undergoing sedation and trauma counselling as I gather I had been unable to stop screaming at the accident scene. In truth, I have no recollection of that event that was erased from my mind like the chalk of a teacher's blackboard, permanently gone, swiped forever. From thenceforth my life changed and my confidence and sense of security was eroded and suctioned out of my life. I no longer trusted the world and shrank and retreated away from it like a tortoise in my shell, desperate to hide away from it all as the world outside my turret tower room became a bad and dangerous place. It would seem over two years no psychologist or prescription medicine could shift me out of my sequestered, cloistered, hermit-like existence, and my desperate parents and my brother Lawrence and sister Cordelia had pretended to my friends that I was spending time in Italy indefinitely. They knew that it would be humiliating for me to ever have to admit that I was locked away in my ivory tower. In truth, I thought there would never be any light at the end of the tunnel. But one day that changed, as it seemed that a touch of the miraculous had infused my life with the sweet scent of victory. The angel responsible for my dramatic, radical transformation was called Leonora. She was my new psychologist, and she wasn't cut out of the same cloth of other mental health care workers that had visited me prior. They had failed abysmably to deliver me from my incarceration. Leonora, on the other hand, followed her heart and natural instincts, rather than the staunch protocol of her medical training that was too rigidly uniform for her. She was a pretty young woman in her late thirties, with a luxurious mane of long auburn hair, and a porcelain fair flawless complexion. I could hear my mother whispering and warning her not to upset me because I was a sensitive soul. 
The elegant woman entered my room like a breath of fresh air, and her soft, lingering, flowery perfume rather reminded me of fresh summer roses. She studied me intently through her judicious, discriminating blue eyes, shaking her mane of golden hair furiously, with a look of extreme indignation on her face, rather like a vet examining an animal in a shoddy, bedraggled condition, and not being altogether very pleased about it. This perfect stranger was not afraid to unleash some brutal hard truths that rolled off her tongue with effortless ease like lethal missiles that hit me hard and were like cruel blows. "'Do you know how pathetic you look, stuck in this room?' she said, walking over to the curtains and drawing them back to allow the light to flood the room. "'Why on earth would you shut yourself away like this and block out the light of a beautiful day like this?' It's ridiculous. You're not a bat, for goodness sake. I sat there in silence, trying to barricade the unkind words from me that were beginning to sting like jellyfish bites. So is this the way you're going to play it, she said. You're just going to ignore me. Is that right? I knew you were pathetic the moment I laid eyes on you. You are rude, I said. I don't want to talk to you. Well... If I'm rude, I can live with that, because I don't have to stay rude forever. But you're pathetic, and you'll stay pathetic all your life if you live in this prison, she piped. All this, she continued, the way you live is completely pathetic, and I blame your parents for giving in to your demands. You want everybody to feel sorry for you, and pussyfoot around you cautiously, wrapping you up in cotton wool like a fine piece of bone china that they're absolutely terrified to break. They're afraid to hurt your feelings. Now that's a crazy way to live, if you ask me. I can see that even your little Yorkshire terrier here has had quite enough. Is that not right? she said, stroking my dog. Woof, woof, said my dog in agreement. I thought he was on my side, Traitor, I thought to myself. I suffer from agoraphobia, I piped. I have a real sickness. Well, I'm a psychologist, she said to me, and I look on those medical terminologies as quintessential excuses for my patients that they can cling on to like a lilo in a swimming pool. Granted, you have been traumatised, and I don't deny that for a moment. But it's still a perfect excuse not to make any real effort to get out of your current situation. The truth is, you're in complete denial. You're failing to see the truth. This room is as likely to burst into flames, just as much as you are likely to be run over by a bus in the morning. You need to understand that we live our lives facing risks every single day. We have no control over the universe, as anything can happen at any time and anywhere, no matter where you are. Do you realise the only thing that you're actually running from is yourself? Now that's truly pathetic, because you're never going to get away from yourself. I had never thought about it like that before, and this impertinent, impudent woman that I initially loathed with a passion over a period of time, I finally grew to love and appreciate like a sister. She was the only person who audaciously removed the blinders from my eyes, made me see how foolish and futile it was hiding myself away from the world and failing to live my life to the fullest. Soon I began to feel like my old self again, as if I'd resurfaced from a long hibernation like a bear and was now hungry to experience life. I visited pizza parlours, met friends for lunch and took walks in the local park and my family was overjoyed by my miraculous recovery. Of course, I never revealed to my friends why I'd been away for so long, and they were disappointed to discover that I didn't know how to speak a word of Italian. But if they were suspicious, they never said anything. "'Your father and I are so proud of you,' my mother said to me. "'You've come such a long way. There were times we never thought you would leave your bedroom. It worried us greatly. "'I'm just so grateful that you persevered, mother,' I said, giving her a huge hug." I believe Leonora saved me. She was able to show me that I couldn't run from myself and that I should learn to accept the spontaneity in life, and I know she was right. She's not your typical psychologist, is she, said my mother, but the only one who managed to get through to you. 
and she wasn't kind in the beginning at all because she really rattled you quite considerably and gave you a hard time. I guess she just pushed me into the deep end and I either had to sink or swim and I chose to swim, I said. One day Leonora told me that she had another project for me to complete to help crack open my shell of independence. I want you to go camping with a friend or with both of your siblings because being up and close to nature and sleeping under the stars will be a great experience for you and I really want you to enjoy it. It'll be your first night sleeping away from home. This was a big deal for me. My sister Cordelia and my brother Lawrence were coming camping with me and we were all enthused about this idea. I surprised myself by losing my apprehension and inhibitions like an old garment I decided to discard. I could feel the once suppressed adventurous inside my character making a startling reappearance, and I began to feel really good. We took the four-hour flight from Toronto to Calgary International Airport, where we hired a 1980s Suzuki Samurai vehicle, which Lawrence drove down some dirt roads towards a private camping ground that was in close proximity to Banff National Park that overlooked exquisite mountainous terrain, impressive glaciers, scenic valleys, flowery meadows, sumptuous forests and bedazzling rivers. Before long we set up camp, pitching up our tents and preparing our fire pit on a sizable clearing, directly opposite a lake with an exquisite turquoise sheen that was surrounded by a backdrop of statuesque sculptural mountains with large clusters of evergreen trees that included Engelmann spruce and logpole pines padding out a third of its base with a thick verdant quilting. On the left side of our camp was a sizable mountainous gradient where a sylvan spiralled in its upward ascent and was filled with rugged hiking and horse riding trails and on our right was a pretty bedazzling flowering meadow bursting with colourful wild flowers like blue tansies, yellow buttercups, yarrow, wild aberta, pink roses and sage, and it was also frequently dotted with the occasional cluster of spruce trees. I watched my sister Cordelia open a big bottle of French champagne while my brother prepared the fire pit. "'What is all this in aid of?' I said, smiling. "'Why the expense of champagne? What are we celebrating?' "'We're celebrating you, Arabella. You've come so far.' "'And we never imagined you'd ever go camping with us,' said Cordelia, her eyes misting over with tears. "'There were times when you were locked away in your ivory tower that we thought we'd lost you forever. "'But it's like you are back home again to roost, and we're so terribly happy.' "'I agree,' said Lawrence, looking at me with a very proud expression on his face. "'We have our beautiful intrepid explorer back again, the girl that is not afraid of anything.' Hold on, I exclaimed. I wouldn't go that far. Maybe at one time, but not any more. Don't be so hard on yourself, teased my brother. I think I can see glimpses of your valiant side reappearing again, like a perennial flower. So let's drink to you, shall we? To Arabella, he said, raising his glass. To Arabella, repeated my sister, toasting me with huge smiles on their faces. "'Who's hungry?' said my brother, applying three hunky-looking steaks and generous-sized burgers to the grill, while Cordelia opened the different packages of the salads that she'd found in the delicatessence in Banff that looked delectable, from pasta dishes to potato salads. I could feel my mouth watering, and as my fork broke open the steak and the juices poured out, they melted in my mouth like butter. I couldn't remember a time when anything tasted this delicious.' "'I just love the town of Banff,' said Cordelia. "'Such a pretty, quaint place. "'It gives you the sense that you really are on holiday. "'It has that Aspen feel about it, only it's way better. "'It's more laid back, charming and congenial, don't you think?' "'We nodded as the food was excellent, "'so much so we didn't want to focus on talking at all. "'After our alfresco meal, we went for a short walk in the Sylvan, "'which was very invigorating.' We eagerly climbed up the precipitous mountainous trail in our leather walking boots, enjoying the panoramic, breathtaking views through the trees overlooking the lower valley, where the rippling lake shimmered and twinkled like a turquoise gem. The forest was exquisitely beautiful, as the pyramid-shaped evergreen trees reached up into the high heavens like tall statues, clustering together like resplendent emerald-green jewels. 
The underbrush was richly carpeted with luxuriant ferns and soft mosses. I can assure you, after being trapped in a bedroom for a couple of years, getting up close and personal to the natural world was simply marvellous for me. I felt like a caged tiger that had finally escaped the confines of my zoo enclosure. We took turns to observe our camping spot from this high elevation through the binoculars in a little overhang between the trees. What is that? I asked, studying something very dark moving towards our campsite and glancing at it with a curious interest. It looked like a bear, but it didn't, for there was something human about this creature. My hands were shaking with excitement as I focused in on it, but its black, shadowy shape moved so fast and swiftly to get an effective focus. What did you see? asked Cordelia, grabbing the binoculars from me. I could hear the tone of her voice drop with disappointment. Don't see anything, she said. It was black. It was hairy. It was big, I piped. Well, that would be a bear, laughed Lawrence. He probably latched on to the smell of our food. Bears have got a superior sense of smell, even more pronounced than that of a dog. You're not worried about your safety, he asked. I have bought a rifle with me and some bear spray, so I doubt the creature's going to give us any problems. It's not that, I said. It's just this bear-like creature had a human face. I'm sure of it. I think you must have had a wee bit too much champagne, sis, said Lawrence teasingly. Or you've been locked away in your castle for far too long and have forgotten what a bear looks like. I knew he was right. That must be what it was. I'd drank far too much champagne and it had gone straight to my head and I was beginning to see things that weren't there. It does happen. I could hear the tweets of the bird's song as I woke the following morning. I had been very drowsy and the moment my head had hit the pillow I had drifted into a deep sleep. I opened my eyes cautiously as the sun was pouring on my face, causing my eyes to squint. It was a pleasant morning and the sunshine was exceedingly enjoyable. But what on earth was I doing lying in a sleeping bag in the middle of a flowery meadow? Truly, I was astonished. How had I got here, I wondered. I should have been in my tent. I then realised that my sister and brother had taken the Leonora approach and thrust me in the middle of the meadow as some kind of practical joke, but I didn't find their actions very amusing, really. Oh, there you are, said Lawrence. I was wondering where you'd got to. What are you doing here in the middle of the meadow in your sleeping bag, if you don't mind me asking? Don't act like you don't know, I said. Nice try, Lawrence, but I know you brought me here last night to sleep under the stars. I know your game plan. That's where you're wrong, said Lawrence. I didn't, he said, looking surprised. Maybe the alcohol went straight to your head. You must have come out here in the middle of the night, in a plastered state. You were rather tipsy last night, I have to admit. People do do crazy things when they're drunk. I can assure you of that. Remind me never to drink again, I said, looking startled. I can't believe it. I must have wandered out here in the middle of the night. I think I must have a low tolerance for alcohol. The following evening, after an exquisite day of hiking and exploring, I certainly resisted the urge to have any alcohol after what had happened to me the previous night. I couldn't trust myself to drink, lest I should pull a crazy stunt like that again. I liked to sleep near the door of the tent, and so I woke up in the night to feel myself being swept up in the air in my sleeping bag with an effortless, seamless ease. But I pretended to be fast asleep. I was terribly pleased. I'd caught my brother red-handed, and he was transporting me to the flowery meadow as a practical joke. But I would go along with it for a moment, and then give him the scare of his life. It would serve him right. I was surprised how graceful my brother's steps were, as he never bumped me once on the journey, and he laid me down on the ground very gracefully. I could hear him chuckling to himself. He thought he was so clever, and that his hoax was terribly funny. I rose up from my sleeping bag like an unsuspecting serpent and pounced on the shadowy form that I perceived was my brother. But this thing that carried me into the meadow had not been my brother at all, but something else. But what was it? 
I stared at the anomalous humanoid creature in absolute astonishment, and our eyes met for a moment. The light of the moon, I suppose it provided enough illumination to see a little bit, because I saw him, well, pretty well. He was tall and lanky, about six foot, I imagine, with wide shoulders, and possibly about four hundred pounds, I couldn't be quite sure about that. But he was covered in long flowing dark hair, but the exact colour was obscured by the dusky darkness. This was the type of creature I'm quite sure I'd seen on the first day of the camp, the creature that looked like a bear with a human face. It stared at me curiously with amused dark eyes that glinted with a red eye shine. I could discern he had a juvenile mischievous energy about him, and he heartily enjoyed playing pranks. The creature began to chuckle, and it wasn't much different to a human chuckle. He proceeded to point at my sleeping bag with his overlong arms, chuckling all the time, as if to say, I fooled you, and you had no idea it was me. He was right, of course. I hadn't known it was him. I began to laugh heartily, as the creature's humour was infectious. His mannerisms, his body movements, and his facial expressions were incredibly comical, and I wasn't intimidated or frightened about him. I sensed his energy was congenial, and I was very responsive to that. The creature made some strange snoring sounds and pointed directly at me. And then he chuckled. <laughs> I know, I said. I am told I have a dreadful snore, and I believe I do sound as bad as that. The creature watched me as I rolled up my sleeping bag into a tight ball and proceeded to walk back to my camp, with the creature following beside me. He appeared to be an effusive, gregarious character that wasn't reticent in any way, because he chatted to me all the way, almost as if he'd known me all my life. In a very strange dialogue I didn't understand, that was very fast and very chirpy. I nodded to him as if I understood every single word he was saying, so as not to appear rude or offhand. When I got to my tent, I used my body language, signing to him to stay and wait exactly where he was, and he seemed to understand my language. I brought out my favourite 80s yo yo, with a Coca Cola sign attached to it, and demonstrated to the creature exactly how to use it. I put on my headlamp to enhance my visibility. The creature examined the logo of the yo yo with an expression of delight on his face, for he seemed to find it beautiful. He looked up at me with thrilled eyes, and he put his slender finger into the string and propelled the circular plastic thing up and down, and he was completely over the moon with my gift. After nodding my goodbyes to the creature, I returned to my tent and then fell into a deep sleep, to awake in the morning screaming. As something slippery was rubbing up and down my legs. It was a large fish. I smiled to myself. I guessed it was from the creature. He'd clearly put this fish into my sleeping bag so that I would know it was from me. It obviously was a gift from him. I ate it for breakfast that morning and shared it with my two siblings, who wondered where I'd got such a phenomenal sized fish from, but I told them nothing. This was my secret that I intended on keeping. I never saw the creature again, as we returned to Toronto that very afternoon, nor did I tell anyone about my anomalous encounter with what I believe was a juvenile Bigfoot. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I stared at the sweeping Rococo wooden staircase, covered with a thick layer of luxurious flamboyant Persian carpeting, done in rich blues and golds. With a great deal of trepidation and a sense of foreboding. Something was very wrong. Who would dump a florid staircase of such consummate and premium quality in the woods like this and abandon and forsake it like that? It seemed nonsensical to me. I had seen things dumped here before. On one occasion, a vagrant who was living here under a parasol like covering of a large oak tree. Nestling in his high quality queen sized bed, like an oversized buzzard, alongside all his worldly possessions. I do remember what a piteous, doleful sight that it was, and it would have taken a torrential downpour of rain to ruin all his furnishings in a heartbeat. The blighted, desolate character called Tim MacArthur was of Scottish lineage, and had been tossed out of his lodgings with very little regard by an obnoxious, cantankerous landlord. As he had not been able to afford his rental costs due to being laid off his job. You know the usual story. 
when power and influence overpowers poverty. My father, who had a very generous heart, easily the size of Montana, which is known as Big Sky County, where our family live and is aptly called the Treasure State, had allowed the poor man to move into a little cottage on our land to manage the stables. An act of charity on my father's part miraculously turned out to be a blessing in disguise, for it would seem that Tim MacArthur proved to be the best, most proficient farmhand my father had ever had, a rare kind of breed who fearlessly incorporated steely grit and determination in his work and was not afraid of getting his hands dirty. Another time, some undetermined stranger had surreptitiously dumped an ornate, baroque, beautifully hand-carved bureau here in the woods with a note sellotaped to its woody surface, which said in bright red capital letters, Danger! Don't remove this bureau under any circumstances. It is haunted. Take it if you wish at your own risk, but you are guaranteed to regret it. I promise you that this ostentatious gilded bureau was never removed from the woods, well, not for three long years, despite its extreme value and obvious desirability, as no one was willing to take the risk of repossessing it, least of all the superstitious members of my own family, which included my father, my mother and my two older sisters, who have long since left home by then, Hazel and Diane, who would never ever be seen dead walking under a ladder, opening up an umbrella indoors, and if anyone ever spilt salt in our household, a little was always tossed over the left shoulder to avoid bad luck. For a long time, the mysterious, seemingly esoteric and cryptic bureau was talk of our town, and many ascertained that the ghostly entity that was clearly attached to the object was wandering the woods at the witching hours of the night. One day, the once pretentious bureau just disappeared from the woods, and by then it was in very poor, rather shoddy condition due to being overexposed to the elements and the natural weathering of time. But clearly someone had seen its potential as a fixer-up project and thought removing it and selling it was worth the risk. Good luck to them. I always wondered how that story must have ended and I crossed my fingers and toes that no harm would have befallen the person courageous and brave enough to evacuate the Bureau from the Jade Treasure Woods. I noticed that even Pittsburgh, my horse's behaviour this morning, was exceedingly peculiar, as his troubled, soulful eyes were locked on the staircase in a fixated stare, and they rolled back in their sockets to reveal the whites, which, as any horse lover will tell you, is not a good sign. His neck looked arched, and he began stomping and pawing the ground awkwardly with his long legs, as if he would rather be anywhere else in the world than in close proximity to the staircase that he clearly could not stand. I'd never seen him behave so troubled and aggrieved like this before. He was an easy-going, complacent, docile horse that was normally not afraid of anything. I was really perturbed by his revelatory reaction that left me in no doubt that something was seriously wrong about this staircase, but what? That was the burning question. I knew animals are definitely sensitive to energy and vibrations, most especially horses, but what could Pittsburgh see that I couldn't, I pondered. I knew he was about to bolt. I had no doubt about that in my mind, because I could see the inevitable twitching signs on his body begin to intensify so I quickly led him by the reins to a grassy meadow outside of the woods, leaving him there to graze happily on his own, while I quickly returned to scrutinise the staircase more scrupulously. I studied it, keeping a safe, cautious, wary and guarded distance, with a heightened level of nervous anxiety, almost as if I was examining a wild animal that I wasn't certain that I could trust, because it might just lash out at me and bite me like a vicious, nasty dog. My horse's reaction to the ambiguous but stunning-looking staircase confounded my determination to not venture too close. Even though I don't consider myself to be a person that is blessed with extrasensory perception, I knew something wasn't right about this staircase. Examining it closely rarely sent horrifying chills down my spine and enveloped me with an uneasy feeling that I simply could not shift or shake off. It was like a blood-sucking leech, leaving me feeling anemic and weak at the knees, 
and unusually wobbly and unsteady upon my feet. Who had placed it in the woods like this, I wondered? Was it another haunted object that someone had chosen to discard because of a sinister ghostly attachment? Possibly. I couldn't be sure about that, but one thing I knew was that this inexplicable staircase did not represent anything good at all. The gleaming polished oak was magnificently carved with exquisite roses, scrolls, and it looked beautiful. It was certainly lavish and ornate, befitting for a home of great grandeur, but I'm no expert on antiques. I certainly did not even want to rub my hands down the contours and grooves and curves and indentations in the wood, as the very idea made me shudder. I needed to leave now, I thought, as the solicitude I felt at this particular moment was growing at an alarming rate, and I got the airy, unsettling feeling that I was being watched by a pair of unseen eyes that sent shivers of dread down my spine. I needed to get out of here now, fast and quickly. Before long, I was trotting down the horse-riding trail through the wooded area, across the flowery meadow, past a rugged mountainous ridge, and then down another horse-riding trail, until I reached the dirt road, which I crossed vertically, reaching the open wooden gate with a sign attached to the top panel, which read Silverwood's Farm. I breathed a huge sigh of relief, and my heartbeat began to slow down significantly, and I sensed that even Pittsburgh was happy to be back, for every minute of our absence had felt like a lifetime. Our family's bedazzling white symmetrical farmhouse with its green slate roof and matching shutters stood elegantly against the emerald green valley like a glistening white pearl with a backdrop of pretty rolling hills and a few clusters of tall statuesque log pole pines. It was like the house welcomed us with a warm effusive embrace much like the long lost prodigal daughter and her estranged horse who had been away for a very long time indeed well, it certainly felt like that anyway. I could see my mother's cheerful, plump form and pillowy breasts running towards me. You got back quickly, she said. Good ride, I nodded. I'm so relieved you're back, said my mother. I could do with your help in the kitchen. I bumped into Lee Patterson in town, and, well, I'm invited the couple over for lunch. I must confess, they did look so down in the dumps and depressed. I can't think why. They're so affluent and prosperous, clearly minted, and live a very lavish, luxurious lifestyle, but I sensed they were masking a deep-rooted sadness. I picked that up straight away. I groaned, rolling my eyes in the back of my head, as my mother was forever inviting every waif and stray of the humankind that she felt sorry for over to lunch or dinner. She simply loved resurrecting people from the depths of despair and depression, like someone diving into the lake to retrieve a drowning kitten. It made her feel good about herself to help other people, as her years as a social worker had given her a natural instinct about people down on their luck. She liked to play the role of a good Samaritan or the quintessential human-like angel, well, as close as you can get anyway. I assure you, every year at Thanksgiving, virtually the entire old age home in our local area was cordially invited for a celebratory lunch, and it had become a standard event in our home that was well known about everywhere. Well, maybe someone they love has died, I piped, or maybe their marital relationship is in trouble, or perhaps they're just having a bad day and got up on the wrong side of the bed. It could be anything, I suggested. Well, we'll see, said my mother, glancing quickly at her watch. We better get cracking with preparing the lunch, as they'll be here in fifteen minutes, and I want the couple to be made to feel welcome. Mr. Lee Patterson and his wife Joyce arrived at the house in minutes. They were a good-looking couple in their early sixties, always very well groomed and meticulously turned out in stylish, fashionable clothes, but not on this occasion. Joyce, whom always looked like she stepped out of a bandbox without a silvery hair out of place and the picture of supreme elegance, was just wearing a casual pair of sneakers and a scruffy pair of blue denim pants, and her usually polished husband looked equally as unkempt, wearing a rather bedraggled-looking pair of jeans and an oversized shapeless T-shirt that was several sizes too large for him. In truth, it looked like they'd been sleeping in their clothes 
and Joyce's usually meticulous silvery hair looked like it had taken a day off from the hairspray and was hanging limply around her face and rat's tails. I'd never seen the couple look so dishevelled before. You could have been forgiven for thinking they were a homeless couple living in Tent City. Before long, the Pattersons had been whisked into the kitchen and were seated at the table, eating bowls of hot steaming potato and leek soup. At first, they didn't appear very hungry, but after a couple of mouthfuls, they tucked into it ravenously, as if they had not eaten for days. And the same could be said for the chicken pie and salad, which they gobbled up hungrily, even asking for seconds. Wow, they were famished. Finally, my mother broke the long drawn out silence, like a loud horn blaring through a football stadium, as everyone jumped out of their skin as she spoke. Out with it, she said. Now, please tell me, what the heck is going on with the both of you? Not to put too fine a point on it, but you both look absolutely dreadful. What in God's name has happened to you? Tears poured down Joyce's gaunt, pale face, and she began to sob while her husband's blue eyes misted over with tears. I could see them reaching for each other's hands and squeezing them tightly for support. Ted is dead, she whispered in a low voice. What did you say, said my mother. I didn't hear you. Joyce raised her voice to a shout. Ted is dead. Are you happy now? That's why we're upset. Get it, she said, sounding very angry. My mother gasped, for she'd known their son Ted for many long years, Oh, my goodness! How dreadful! How absolutely awful! I don't know what to say! I can't believe it! I had absolutely no idea! Oh, my word! I am so, so sorry! What happened? Well, as you know, Ted lives in Texas these days. He came to stay with us over the weekend. He was in very good form, wasn't he, dear? He went to work last Tuesday. Just collapsed on the spot, lost consciousness and died. The coroner hasn't been able to identify the cause of his death, even after the autopsy. It's a complete enigma, because he, because he was so, so healthy. We haven't any family history of heart disease or cancer, so we've no explanation for why he just died. It makes no sense at all. Oh, I'm so, so sorry, said my mother. I can't imagine what the two of you must be going through. Losing a kid, it's a hell of a deal. And not knowing what happened to him is the worst thing of all. You say that he looked well when you last saw him? Joyce blew her nose <laughs> and wiped her tears away from her eyes. Well, he was looking marvellous, but after he went hiking in the Jade Treasure Forest... He did return home looking peaky and a little out of sorts after the shock that he'd incurred. But, but he is a resilient chap. You know, he bounced back from the trauma and was fighting fit again. Really, he was. Shock? said my mother, looking befuddled. What kind of shock are we talking about here? Well, he claimed uh, to have encountered a staircase in the woods that was very ornate, very beautifully carved, and... He was mesmerised by it and considered it perhaps, well, removing it and replacing his mediocre modern staircase he has in his house in Texas with this eye-catching piece of art. He said it was stunning. At that startling revelation, my ears perked up like a German shepherd dog, for I knew that Ted had stumbled across the very same staircase that I had observed only a while ago in the Jade Treasure Forest, which is where I'd been but I had the common sense not to go near the thing. My hair stood up on end, and I listened with bated breath to the conversation as it proceeded. Well, as Ted began to climb up and down the staircase, he said he felt very odd. He said it made him feel a bit light-headed and queasy, disorientated, if you know what I mean, and his ears began to pop like they do on an aeroplane at a different air pressure. I mean, how does that happen on a staircase, for goodness sake? What would make your ears pop? All of a sudden, he sensed he wasn't alone and that something appeared to be watching him. And he discerned a strong, sweaty, musty smell infusing the air and beheld this blurry, umbrageous, indistinguishable, sultry figure moving stealthily between the trees and watching him. 
He said he was so petrified because this thing, whatever it was, appeared to be very substantial in size. It was grunting and snorting and snarling. It was clearly not friendly towards him, whatever it was, and began to randomly throw stones at him. I do remember him saying that although he couldn't see this thing, he sensed it was a formidable, intimidating presence and knew it could not have possibly been a bear, but it was easily as big. He said this thing didn't want him anywhere near the staircase. He felt certain of that, and so he hightailed it out of there as fast as he could, overcome with the most debilitating, horrifying fear. How extraordinary, reflected my mother. I mean, why a staircase in a woods, for goodness sake? We had a haunted bureau there once. Everybody swore that there was a ghost attached to it. It's decidedly odd to dump an ostentatious antique staircase there. Oh, people, they are odd sometimes. They do get rid of the strangest things. And by the sounds of things, it was a rather ornamental staircase that could possibly fetch a tidy sum at an antique sale. So it's very peculiar. That's not all, said Joyce, once again blowing her nose. Uh, one of Ted's homeboys came to join us for lunch that day. You know the Kitchener boy? Yes, I think his name's Kramer, that's right. Oh yes, I know him very well, said my mother. Lovely, lovely lad. He helped us repaint the stable block last summer and did an amazing job, I might add. Well, Kramer was very impressed about what had happened to Ted after listening to his peculiar account about what had transpired in the forest and how he'd chanced upon the anomalous staircase. So Kramer is a fearless type with an ambitious inquiring mind, you know the sort. So armed with a rifle for protection, he was desirous to investigate the jade treasure woods for himself. He's absolutely fascinated by antiques and was so curious about the kind of animal my son encountered, so he wanted answers. It wasn't long before he came upon the staircase and climbed onto the very top step. He described being overwhelmed with an inexplicable nauseous feeling that he felt was like rats gnawing up his insides. In a trice he discerned that he was being watched by a pair of invisible spectral eyes, so he quickly left the woods, but got the very clear distinct impression that something was following him from behind. When he left the woods he did hear whistling sounds, but he was sure that there were no hikers there. We found out this morning from his mother that he was lying motionless in his bed this morning and was deceased. Now that young man was the epitome of good health, so what happened to him, God only knows. I can only hope that his autopsy sheds more light over this intriguing mystery, for two young men have succumbed to an unexplainable death, and it's very, very bizarre. My mother's face grew very grave. He's dead too, she gasped. Now that is very, very peculiar. What are the chances of two young, healthy people dropping down dead without so much as a buy or leave? Do you think it has anything to do with the ill-fated staircase, she asked. My mother was very superstitious. Could it be cursed or doomed? An object that is somehow jinxed, possibly? A while back, there was a bureau that was claimed to be haunted in the woods, as I mentioned before. No one went near the thing. I gather anyone who ventured into those woods at night claimed to see white orbs floating through the trees, and they would hear this menacing whispering, and it terrified the locals at the time. I don't think you'd moved into the area when the Bureau was around. Well, I did hear all about that, said Mr Patterson nervously, as if wondering whether he should share something that he'd been withholding for a while. What is it, sweetheart? asked Joyce. Out with it. If that woods has got something to do with what happened to our son, you need to tell us about it. It's probably nothing, said Mr Patterson, rubbing his moustache reflectively. But I do remember driving past the jade treasure wood one night and seeing a tall, dark, shadowy creature covered with hair slipping into the trees. I don't think it was a bear, but in truth I did think my imagination was deceiving or playing tricks with me. This thing, it was colossal. It looked like a human, just covered in hair. I had been for a business lunch that day, and drank quite a substantial amount of wine. And, well, I did put it down to my imagination. I couldn't see what else it could be. I did wonder whether it was possibly a shadowy figure of a ghost or something. 
I don't have any idea what it was. Don't be so ridiculous, sweetheart, piped Joyce. If that thing was real, what does an animal have to do with what happened to our son? He dropped down dead, for goodness sake. He wasn't mauled by a wild animal in the woods. And as for curses, well, I'm very sorry. Such an idea is quite preposterous. You and I know curses are not real, and I certainly don't believe that things are doomed or jinxed. I'm sorry, I just don't buy into all this kind of nonsense. It's all superstitious claptrap, that's what it is. Once the Pattersons had left our home, and my mother had worked her usual magic in uplifting the grieving couple and encouraging them to seek professional counselling, which they agreed would be a good idea, I could not get the horrific death of their son out of my mind and this incongruous event became as irritating to me as an itch that you can't stop scratching because it bothers you that much. What do you think, my mother asked me, as she soaked the dirty dishes into the hot suds in the sink? Do you think poor Ted died because of a curse linked to that staircase? I don't know what I think, I said, but I do know this. Something isn't right with that staircase. That night, as I lay in my bed, I woke up in a cold sweat. I was physically shaking. I realised I'd been having nightmares about the staircase in the woods and my horse was in such a state in the dream that he was beating it with his hooves. All of a sudden, the punctilious, responsible side of myself became restless and panicky. I knew I needed to do my civil duty and protect people from that staircase, but waiting until the morning was far too late. It wasn't an option. Supposing it really was cursed... The locals visiting the woods needed to be warned about it, and the sooner the better. There was no time to waste, as more people could potentially die. It was twelve o'clock at night, but I did not care. I hurriedly began drawing up signs on cardboard and red pen, and wrote in very large lettering, Warning! Do not attempt to touch, move, or climb this cursed, haunted staircase, for doing so may indeed result in deadly consequences. I was anxious about leaving the house at this late hour of night, but I was so concerned I knew I needed to get to the woods before anybody else invariably did, and I needed to put up those signs at once. Someone might be up at the crack of dawn, walking down some of those hiking trails with their dogs, and if they should stumble across the staircase, they could potentially become as intrigued as both Ted and Kramer had been, and look at what had become of both of them. In my book, there is no such thing as coincidence, as lightning rarely strikes in the same place twice. Was I completely stark raving mad, I wondered, as I rode my bicycle in the dead of night, with my cardboard signs placed in my shopping basket on the front of my bike. My tyres wobbled precariously, zigzagging down the bumpy, dusty lanes, with only the light of my headlamp and bicycle for visibility, which was not very illuminating, to say the least. As for the moon and the silvery stars, it seemed like they'd taken the night off, for their normally resplendent showing in the inky skies was very faint and imperceptible this evening. And as for the street lights, there was no such luxuries in this part of the world, so the calganous darkness appeared cold and uncongenial, and the brisk breeze rustled, blowing through the tall, lanky trees that seemed to almost morph into human-like giants, and I felt as if malevolent eyes were watching me almost everywhere. Was it my imagination? More than lightly. But riding a bicycle in the dim duskiness was not an easy accomplishment, especially for someone like me, who naturally feared the dark. I struggled not to glance at the ominous gloomy shadows that danced through the trees and to ignore the cold breeze that blew against my sweater. I tried not to think of anything at all, but instead I focused on the job at hand, and that was getting to the Jade Treasure Woods, as quickly as I possibly could. The strong scent of pine from the blackjacks and yellow pine trees enveloped the air with the fresh citrusy woodland scent, and it was very invigorating and uplifting, as the sounds of the crickets and the frogs offered a measure of reassurance. A lone owl flying above my head and letting out a shrill, piercing hoot alarmed me so much that I nearly lost my balance and went flying off my bike, but luckily I didn't. How I managed to get to the Jade Treasure Woods, I honestly don't know, for it had been one hell of an arduous mission that had required a great deal of courage on my part. I propped my bike up against a western hemlock tree, using its hefty base as a buttress, 
and I ventured into the woods with my signs held up in my hands. I could see the hazy outline of the staircase and was heedful to keep a vigilant distance. I found a couple of sugar maple trees with sizable trunks situated a hundred yards from the staircase, directly facing the front side of the hiking trail, and could easily be perceived by hikers and strangers alike. I tied my signs to the trees, feeling a huge monumental sense of relief overwhelm me. My mission was at last complete. I was just about to return to my bicycle when I discerned an ethereal, gentle, bluish luminescence lighting up the staircase and something drew my attention towards it. I stood there in absolute astonishment. As I swear to you, I saw all kinds of balls or silvery or white orbs of light that were floating up and down this staircase. It looked to me like the staircase was some sort of a portal for the dead to manifest into our world, like the bubbles from a bubble machine. There were thousands of these round spectral light forms, some a lot brighter than others. I was so dumbfounded, I'd never seen anything like this before. I stared in amazement at what I was seeing, but dazzled by the experience, and too confounded to actually feel any sense of fear. Could it be that climbing this staircase was almost like severing or loosening the silver cord that connects us to the physical world and our reality? I didn't know. I couldn't be sure. Is that what could have happened to Kramer and Ted, I wondered? Maybe their cords had suddenly snapped in inappropriate moments. All of a sudden I realised I wasn't alone. It was an ominous, heavy, oppressive feeling. I sent sharp, discerning eyes were upon me, and I was being studied and observed. But by whom? I could feel nervous chills running down my spine and a powerful gnawing in my stomach that began to churn my anxiety like butter and I could taste a bitter biliousness on my tongue. Everything became strangely quiet, and even the sounds of the crickets and frogs had faded away and dissipated like the steam from a kettle. I needed to get out of here fast, quick, I thought. Something wasn't right. All of a sudden, one rock came thundering in my direction, landing yards away from me on the ground. Then another and another. Someone wanted me gone from this place, but who? Then I saw him, the offender, whom had been throwing stones at me to frighten me away. I was perturbed, astonished, beguiled, because no words can begin to describe the size of this monstrously Herculean-sized beast that was brawny, solid, dense and stockily built, with a barrel-sized chest and colossal shoulders. This thing looked human. But he wasn't totally human, for his head shape was like that of a large cone, and it seemed to fold into his shoulders seamlessly without any sign of a neck. Then there were the overlong arms, something that I've often discerned in the primate species. But despite everything, this creature was not an ape. The critter looked directly at me and emitted a low guttural growl that reminded me of my little pooch at home, when he got overprotective over his doggy treats. It was like a gentle warning, a nudge, if you like, telling me to go kindly. Yet I knew in my gut that this creature was not unkind or mean. He had my best interests at heart. I really knew this, and I don't even know why I did. I nodded to the creature and turned around to make the bicycle trek back home. But that was a night I was never, ever likely to forget. As was expected, the autopsy report on Kramer was also undetermined, and any clear cause of death was registered as unknown. It would seem that my warning cards on the trees had done the trick, for all the locals in the area simply refused to even so much as touch the staircase, as the town folk were exceedingly superstitious, and I am so glad they were. I did hear that one young boy had climbed it without any adverse effects, but he could have been making up the story, or maybe he just got lucky. In the years that followed, I was to hear bizarre accounts about staircases and woods, and I cannot fathom what they actually all mean. But I do know that the creature I encountered that night was most certainly a Bigfoot, and I believe he was protecting me from venturing close to the staircase, which I believe was some kind of a portal. The staircase remained an unlikely fixture and fitting in our woods for over three years, and one day it miraculously vanished, much like the Bureau had done. 
never to be seen again, much to the relief of all the locals. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, the phone in the entrance hall rang and rang, its ear-piercing shrill sound attacking my eardrums with its strident obtrusiveness, rather like a nagging old hag. All right, all right, I said. Calm down, I'm coming. Keep your knickers on. I groaned, climbing out of the layers of my warm blanketed bed very begrudgingly, trembling as the icy coldness blasted my face and I began to shiver. Bloody hell! I thought, this is really annoying. Our condo in Boston seemed to be so hot in the summer and icy cold in the winter, which meant getting out of bed at the crack of dawn was exceedingly laborious. I dubiously grabbed my dressing gown and threw it over my shoulders, along with my woolly slippers that tended to drag on the ground, making a very annoying squeaking sound. My poor wife heaved a pillow over her ears to try and block out the offending sounds that were rudely interrupting her dreams. Who the hell was phoning us at this ungodly time of the morning, I thought, glancing briefly at the clock. Oh my goodness, it was two o'clock for goodness sake. Whoever was phoning us at this ungodly hour, they certainly better have a good excuse or explanation, I thought indignantly. All of a sudden, I seemed to wake up. The fuzzy haziness of my groggy state was hoisted up like the sails on a boat, as a scary thought glided across my mind, like a seagull soaring and flying into the heavenlies. My heart began to pound violently in my chest. It did not bode well for us. Someone to be phoning us this early, I mean. It must be important, I thought. I quickened my pace and hurriedly scurried to the phone. My hands began to tremble uncontrollably. I was shaking like a leaf as I regarded the receiver, like a threatening hazard that could potentially explode and blow up in my hand like a small pipe bomb hidden in a package in the post. What I can only describe as a wavering hesitancy and a dividend reluctance gripped me violently like a very angry drunken man challenging me at a local bar. In a trice, I desperately tried to fight and conquer this debilitating fear, and it wasn't easy. Finally, with a renewed sense of courage that rose up like a surface breaker that I was desirous to overcome, I finally lifted up the receiver to my ear. Hello, I said in a timid, uncertain voice. Hello, sir, came the very slick voice at the other end of the line. I'm very sorry to phone you at this inconvenient time of the morning, but I do have you registered as the next of kin for a Mrs. Cassandra de Santos. Is that right? Yes, that is right. She's my deceased mother's older sister, I explained. And you, you are Claudia de Santos. Is that right? Yes, sir, I am he. Is everything all right? Something hasn't happened to Cassandra. Please, no. She is all right, isn't she? The tentative, almost ambivalent voice at the other end of the line softened considerably into a sympathetic tone, and my heart held on to its beat as if holding my breath underwater. Every part of me sensed that this phone call was not good news, and my instinctive feelings were not wrong. I am sorry, sir, but I do have some very bad news for you. Very unfortunate news, I'm afraid. News I wish I didn't have to convey to you. You are not on your own, are you? Because you need someone there to support you. No, my wife is here with me. Good. You will be needing her support, Mr. DeSantis. I regret to have to inform you that your Aunt Cassandra de Santis was found lying hanged in her closet this evening by a neighbour who was checking in on her to see she was all right. I'm afraid it was self-inflicted. A suicide, I believe. I'm truly sorry for your very tragic loss, and I would love to express my deepest condolences to you and your family. All of a sudden I went numb. A heavy lump developed at the back of my throat. 
I was unable to find any words for a second. I had lost my ability to speak. I stood at the phone like a waxwork statue at Madame Tussauds, unable to comprehend what I'd heard. Mr. DeSantis! Uh, Mr. DeSantis! Uh, Mr. DeSantis! came the concerned voice. Are you still there, Mr. DeSantis? Uh, Mr. DeSantis, are you there? Uh, yes, I said. Is she really dead? You're not being serious, are you? Uh, she can't be. I'm so sorry, sir. I wish I could say otherwise. I really do. Would you like me to send a grief counsellor around to your home? I've got some names here about people in Boston who could help you. No. Uh, no, thank you. I'll be fine, I said. Thank you very much for letting me know. I put down the receiver and stared into space, my body immobilised by shock. Cassandra, my only surviving relative, had hung herself in her closet. I'd only seen her last weekend, and she had appeared to be in such good form. But maybe that had just been a clever little act on her part, to mask how rotten she was really feeling. But why? Why would she do this to herself? Of course... I knew the answer to that question before I even asked it. Cassandra had been suffering from the long-drawn-out effects of fibromyalgia, a very debilitating illness that saps and drains your energy like a blood-sucking leech. It causes twitches, muscle cramps and shooting pains that can be so dreadful it's almost unbearable for the sufferer. Then there's the booming, thunderous migraine headaches the restlessness, the inability to sleep, the exhaustion, the impaired memory, and the heavy clouds of depression and despair that are as enfeebling, disabling and compromising as the illness itself. My wife Lucy was standing in the entrance hall, staring at me. Her blonde ringlets tossled wildly around her face, and her blue eyes looked wide with fear. Oh my goodness, what's happened, she said. You look as white as a ghost. You're scaring me. Is everything all right? I'd never been one to cry, but tears poured down my cheeks. I shook my head wearily. Cassandra is dead, I cried, and then I began to scream. She's dead! She's dead! Oh, my God! My only surviving relative in the world is dead! You are not alone, said my wife, cradling me in her arms. You have me. That had all happened about two months ago, and Cassandra had left us her entire estate in the Montana countryside, which included her enchanting, beguiling farmhouse, which was in a remote part of the world, a full 25 minutes away from the local town, which wasn't that bad. My wife and I were from Boston, otherwise known as Beantown, but had always fancied moving to the countryside and Cassandra's death had prompted us to seize this fabulous opportunity with both hands. We had decided to experiment by living in Cassandra's farmhouse for a while to discern if long-term this new, more carefree way of life would befit us, as we were novices to the rural lifestyle. We wondered if we would get homesick for the swinging city, its buzzing activity, fabulous eateries and restaurants, sophisticated culture from art galleries, theatres to museums and so much more. This was the beginning of a fabulous whole new adventure for us in the Rocky Mountain Big Sky State, rather like tasting a whole new ice cream flavour for the very first time in your life and discerning whether you were partial to it or not, and it can be a question of acclimatising to new people, a new environment and a brand new way of life. I was very privileged and fortunate to be able to work from home and return to my company in Boston every couple of months for a day or so. Montana is an exquisite part of the world, and it is a varied state of statuesque mountains, rivers, canyons, valleys, grassy fields, badlands and caverns, so what was there not to like about this adventure? Our car ambled happily down the windy dirt roads, which seemed to go on forever and ever. While the tough, hardy tyres of our burgundy-coloured Toyota Land Cruiser seemed to siphon up the clouds of brown dust in the air, you could hear the little pebbles beating under its underbelly. It didn't help that the wind whistled through the trees, making the journey rather more precarious. 
I heaved a huge sigh of relief as our four-wheel drive meandered down the tree-shaded drive of Douglas firs and Ponderosa pines towards the farmhouse. It was signposted Whispering Pines, which was a very apt name, I thought. We're here, I said, pulling up the handbrake and switching off the engine. For a moment, there was a long silence in the car, and my wife and I just sat there for a while, not saying a single word. We stared at the farmhouse, almost as if we were viewing it for the very first time in our lives. I could see Cassandra's colourful free-range chickens in the front yard, pecking away hungrily and happily in the flower beds that were full of larkspurs, asters and Jacob's ladders, and the magnificent, glorious hanging baskets filled with blue lobelia and petunias, and the terracotta pots of colourful mixed geraniums looked like someone had been diligently watering them because they were bursting with delicate rose-like blooms, and even the lavish emerald green lawns in the front yard appeared to have been mown with meticulous precision. Some kindly neighbour had been looking after the place very attentively, I thought. I would certainly need to express my extreme appreciation to them. It was clear that we had very good neighbours. I felt an uneasy edginess overcome me, almost as if the house itself was watching me with a pair of judicious eyes. It was an attractive, box-shaped, symmetrical farmhouse, painted in a soft lemon-yellow colour with lines of straight blue framed wooden windows, with matching shutters across the façade of the house. It was extremely pleasing to the eye. Even more appealing to me was the expansive front deck that stretched the full length of the building and overlooked the resplendent panoramic mountainous views to the rear of our home. On the right side of our pretty yard was a woodland expanse with hiking trails and an enchanting creek. When I was a little boy I would play in those woods a great deal. I used to love messing around in that creek. For me it was a magical, verdant wonderland that I was looking forward to rediscovering all over again. This is it, I said, climbing out of the car and chivalrously opening my wife's door for her, like a true Boston gentleman. We had not been back to the house since Cassandra's death. It appeared oppressive and dark, with all the yellowing bedraggled curtains drawn, and there was a stale, musty heaviness that seemed to linger in the air, Possibly a reflection of Cassandra's melancholy and sorrowful state of mind. I certainly believe that to be the case. It's like you can feel the sad energy in the home, said my wife, looking perturbed. Like you can pick up her sickness. I'm not sensitive, but it's like I can feel the footprint that she laid on this home, if you know what I mean. It's rather weird. We need to put our own footprint on this place now. Oh, by the way... I found this for you. It was in the entrance hall, she said, handing me an envelope addressed to me. I immediately recognised the familiar, curly, elegant handwriting, and my heart began to sink. Before I could think too deeply about it and have any misgivings, I swiftly tore open the envelope and read the letter. It read, Dear Claudia, I have not taken the decision to end my life easily, but the pain of this debilitating disease has drained me. I feel like I'm hanging on to life by a thread, barely making through each day. It's a struggle and a drawn-out battle for me. A fight that I have lost, for this disease has won over my will to live. It's the pain, the unbearable pain, the pounding headaches that are just too much to bear. Please don't hate me for taking the easy way out, because believe me, it was not an easy choice to make, especially leaving you. I'm mindfully aware that you are the only surviving member of the DeSantis family, and it grieves my heart. But you can redeem that by having children of your own one day, and I sincerely hope you do. I'll be watching over you, in a place where I hope I can find a measure of peace. Please do not hate me for my choice. If there had been another option, I would most certainly have taken it. Remember that I love you forever. Your loving aunt, Cassandra. Oh, my word, that is so desperately sad, said my wife, her eyes misting over with tears. The poor woman, she must have been in dreadful pain. I'm absolutely appalled that the doctors were unable to keep that pain of hers under control. You'd think they would do better than this in this day and age, wouldn't you? I mean, for people in Cassandra's condition. I remember her telling me that smoking cannabis medicinally had helped her considerably but clearly not enough. 
Poor Cassandra, I said. She must have been desperate. Really desperate. Fast forward an entire month, and we had transformed our home with luxurious new curtains, a lick of fresh paint, and elegant, comfortable furnishings, alongside contemporary art pieces and some eclectic showstoppers. In a trice, our house was beginning to feel like our home, as if we had left our invisible mark on it. It would seem that the initial heavy, oppressive atmosphere that had lingered in our home like a noxious, putrid, rank, very bad smell had finally abated. My wife had smudged the place with sage and sprayed essential oils of orange and cinnamon in every nook and cranny, and the muggy, suffocating and stifling atmosphere had miraculously changed and lifted, and light seemed to permeate our house in a blissful warmth. It truly seemed to transmutate from a dreary, drab, grey cocoon into a vibrant, colourful butterfly. As such was the transformation of our sumptuous, cosy and very snug home that made us very inclined to want to stay here permanently and lay down roots. We had met many of the locals who were warm, convivial and friendly people who had been so welcoming towards us, including our immediate neighbour, a delightful woman called Becky Conway, who was the unfortunate one to discover my aunt hanging in her closet. Well, so I thought. It must have been about the second day we'd moved into our new home that Becky Conway, our next-door neighbour, rocked up at our front doorstep with a very generous, delectable basket of homemade goodies for us as a moving-in welcoming gift, which included a pretty pot of lavender violets, a baked lasagna, garlic bread, salad, a generous bottle of wine, and for afters a mouth-watering chocolate strawberry cheesecake. It didn't get better than that. You can't expect us to eat this all alone, I said. Why not join us for dinner? This is incredibly kind of you. Actually, that would be really rather nice, she said, shaking my hand firmly. It would be so lovely to get to know the two of you better. I hope we can be friends. Cassandra spoke of you a lot. She said only good things about you, of course, loved the bones of you, and saw you more like a son rather than a nephew. Well, that is good to hear, I chuckled. Do sit down and make yourself at home, I said, gesturing for her to seat down on the cosy settee. My word, this is quite marvellous. You've completely transformed this home from a sour's ear into a silk purse, dare I say. Poor Cassandra, she didn't have the energy to invest in making her home into a cosy den, like you clearly have done. Becky was a gentle, very endearing woman in her early sixties, with a thick thatch of short brown hair and a wrinkle-free complexion, with, of course, the exception of some endearing crow's feet that crinkled around her pretty brown eyes when she smiled and only added to her charm. I could sense that she was an easy-going, laid-back sort of woman, with a very generous heart, the kind of woman that everybody would like as a neighbour. I imagine if you needed her help, she would be around in a heartbeat to ferry you to the local hospital or lend you a bag of sugar for that chocolate cake you were planning to bake. You wouldn't happen to know who has been watering our plants and mowing our lawn and cleaning our pool in the backyard, I asked. Oh, laughed Becky, that would be my husband Bernie. You haven't met him yet. I must introduce you. He did mow your lawns and clean the pools while you were away, but I, I was the one that did your watering. We appreciate it so very much, I said. It's very kind of you. Only a pleasure, she said. That's what neighbours do for each other, isn't it? Before long we were tucking into delicious plates of hot lasagna and salad. This is fabulous, I said, tucking into the moist layers of pasta, ground meat and cheese sauce. I gather you were the one to find my aunt hanging in the closet. I'm very sorry about that. It couldn't have been easy for you. Actually, it is quite a story, said Becky, taking a sip of her wine. That's not quite how it happened. I sensed there was something wrong with Cassandra, as I saw her almost every single day. She always used to bring me eggs from her chickens and vegetables from the backyard. She was very generous like that. But I hadn't seen her for a few days, so I was beginning to worry about her. That means she must have been in a considerable amount of pain, I imagine. 
Oh, Cassandra suffered terrible pain, admitted Becky, but it had to be really incapacitating for her not even to leave her home for a few days. It was extraordinary. I remember I was lying in bed on the night she died. It must have been about midnight. I woke up with a start and I began to shake my husband, Bernie, very vigorously. I said, Bernie, something's wrong with Cassandra. I can feel it in my gut. I've got to go and check on her. I do remember he groaned and said something like, Can't you wait until the morning? Go back to sleep. But of course I didn't listen. I can be bull-headed and obstinate at times. You mean you sensed that something was wrong with Cassandra? I asked in amazement. Absolutely, said Becky, looking at me with very intense, earnest brown eyes. She was beginning to shiver as she recalled the event. It was exceedingly odd, because I'm not an intuitive person by any manner of means, but in my gut, I truly felt as if something was terribly wrong. It felt as if there was something off that I couldn't quite determine what it was. It was like this sense of knowing overcame me. I was terrified about what I might discover, because there were times your aunt had secretly confided in me that she was in such horrendous, despicable pain that she had seriously considered flying to Switzerland for euthanasia. She'd even gone so far as to make inquiries. She really considered that. Really? She said that to you? I asked, looking appalled. That's absolutely ghastly. I had no idea her pain was that bad. Becky nodded gingerly. Fibromyalgia is a very distressing disease indeed. It's grossly misunderstood. Some doctors actually refuse to recognise it as a legitimate illness. But believe me, it's real. I've seen your aunt's courage and strength over the years, which has been admirable. She has faced such tortuous adversity and suffering. She's a remarkable woman, really. Anyway, I remember that night with a crystal clear clarity. But it wasn't pretty. No, it wasn't pretty at all. It was very cold with a gentle breeze blowing, and I got the sense that it was about to rain, as the air was enveloped with that earthy clean smell. I love that smell. Well, it turned out it did rain later. I hastily gathered my dressing gown over my shoulders and put on some sneakers as a matter of urgency and ventured speedily towards your house, armed with a torchlight in my hands. I was terrified of what I might find. Well, she grimaced, I was more than just afraid. I was truly petrified. I was walking down the moist lawn towards the house, and your aunt's outside lights were luckily all on. I could see very clearly, although the moonlight was excellent that night, which meant I wasn't intimidated by the dusky darkness, which would normally have been the case. But I nearly had a heart attack, because I discerned a powerful muscular back of a tall, dark, shadowy form, removing your aunt's clothing from her washing line, with its overlong arms, and placing them very neatly in a pristine pile in her laundry basket. My first impression of the thing was that it was a man wearing a monkey suit, because when its head swiveled around in my direction, it had a distinctive human face, with very high cheekbones and a pronounced brow ridge, with a pyramid-shaped head. I tell you that even the skin colour and texture and tone rather reminded me of a Native American Indian. This thing could not have been a man, though, because he was huge, built like a giant, muscular, dense, stocky and powerful. It looked alarmed and bewildered when it saw me, and scurried away very quickly, with a frightened look on its face. I got the distinct impression he was disappointed to have been seen and observed, and caught off guard. I think he was naturally reticent and evasive by nature. He moved away very quickly, floating across the lawn, and his arms seemed to be gliding backwards and forwards as he moved, like someone power-walking. I'd never seen anything like that before. He moved so fast, just like a cheetah. So what do you think this thing was? I asked, looking rather perturbed. I'm not sure, really. I don't know what I thought it was, but as I said, the creature was way too big to be human, because it was eight foot tall. You don't get humans that tall, and three feet wide across the very powerful shoulder area. And I would hasten to bet he was over 600 pounds, but he wasn't overweight or fat. We're talking about 600 pounds of dense, heavy muscle. He was covered in long, flowing hair that was scant under the arms and around the knee area. 
which I suppose makes sense given the friction of skin in those areas. I did wonder why it was removing your aunt's washing, as though he was helping her. I wondered if she was familiar and acquainted with this creature. It was a distinct possibility, although she's never mentioned it to me. I mean, it was incredibly human-looking, with the exception of being covered in very long hair. And the hair was very neat and very fine. It looked almost as if it had been brushed. And when the creature held my gaze for a moment with its deep-set dark eyes, I could tell it was incredibly intelligent. And when I say intelligent, I'm not talking about the intelligence of a dog or gorilla. I'm talking about the same intelligence of a human, possibly more. Were you frightened? No, not at all. That's the funny, very peculiar thing. Maybe I should have been. I was too mystified and intrigued because I couldn't fathom or comprehend what this creature actually was. And when I went back home and told Bernie about my mysterious encounter, he was unable to believe my incredulous account. It was too fantastical for him and outlandish. He couldn't take it on board, which I suppose I did understand, although it was enormously frustrating for me to have a husband that was too cynical to believe my story. Anyway, back to what I was saying, I wanted to focus on the job at hand and check that Cassandra was all right. So you can imagine my surprise when I discovered the blue front door was ajar, and the wind kept banging it backwards and forwards against the frame, and it was creaking. It was a haunting, surreal and ghostly experience, like something that you would rather expect to encounter in a horror movie. I stood there calling out Cassandra's name, but she didn't answer. I also got the sense that something was watching me from the trees. I guessed it might have been the anomalous creature that I'd seen at the washing line. I certainly as suspected as much. I glanced back towards the thick fringe of ponderosa pines, but I couldn't see anything, but I certainly felt the eyes on me. I wasted no time and ran through the house, racing up the staircase, and my heart sank when I saw a big trail of muddy footprints entrenched in the cream carpets on the stairs. It was one hell of a mess. I came to the swift conclusion that this intimidating creature had been in the house, and based on his appearance, I was worried that he might have hurt your aunt. By this stage, my heart began to race and thunder in my chest, and I began to almost have a panic attack. I quickly ran up to your aunt's bedroom like a bat out of hell, expecting the very worst. So you found her then hanging in the closet, I said. That must have been dreadful. I just can't imagine. Well, not exactly, said Becky. I actually could see that she had hung herself, as there was rope still around her neck. But she was lying on a bed of soft moss and covered with pretty wild flowers that were scattered all over her body, like colourful confetti. She looked so peaceful and really quite beautiful. I'm so used to seeing the pronounced tension in her forehead, but in death there was none of that. On the contrary, she looked younger, prettier, more relaxed. She was definitely at peace, and her body was still very warm, so I think she had only recently just killed herself. I gasped. Are you being serious? She was still warm. You found her like that? covered in flowers and on a bed of moss. Not only that, there was a stone placed in her hand, a pretty stone. I was sure there was a significance behind the stone, but I don't know what it was, she said, opening her handbag to hand it over to us. It was a very attractive stone, but what its purpose was, I never found out. You think the creature that you saw took my aunt down from the hanging rope in the closet? I do, said Becky. I genuinely do. Whatever he was, he really adored your aunt. For two weeks after her death, I promise you, I genuinely heard howling from the woods, like something lamenting and wailing. It was very distressing. Even Bernie said something was very, very upset. I knew it must be the creature. He was mourning your aunt's demise. I'm certain of it. I know it sounds peculiar, but I think he loved your aunt, like a really good friend. He must have been quite attached to her, but she never told me about the friendship. Perhaps she thought I'd never believe her. It's all very sad, she said, wiping away a tear. This whole wretched business, it's all desperately sad, and such a waste to lose your aunt like this. What did the police have to say, I asked. Well, 
They have never seen anything like it before, and were indeed very perplexed and puzzled about the sheer scale of large footprints on the stairs and the mossy undergrowth that Cassandra was lying on in her death. At first, they didn't rule out foul play and thought that an intruder had tried to murder her and make it look like suicide and did a lousy job to cover up their tracks, but they did think that the perpetrator had exceedingly large feet. The police were reassured when the coroner swiftly arrived on the scene to allay their fears to rest because she finally confirmed that there was no foul play in Cassandra's death and that she definitely hung herself and someone had taken her down from the rope but no one knew who that was except me of course and I wasn't going to tell anyone about it. I didn't want them to think I was barking mad. I must say, said Becky, I'm so glad I never saw her hanging there. That would have been very tough for me, so the creature was kind taking her down like that. It was good of him to do that. Fast forward to the summer, a whole year later, when I found that the dried washing on our line was regularly replaced on our front doorstep before it was about to rain heavily and was always neatly folded. My wife and I have never been that tidy. It was as if someone had realised it was going to rain and they collected our washing from the line before it got soaked, which was a kind, spontaneous thing for them to do. It certainly made me wonder if it was the work of the hairy humanoid. Then, of course, there was another time when a box of berries landed up on our front doorstep and no one confirmed that they had been responsible for gifting us, so we were perplexed as to where they came from. Once again, I do think it was the work of the hairy critter. One lovely summer's day when the sun permeated the air in a blissful, congenial warmth, I ambled very happily into the woods, feeling mellow, jubilant and serene. I was well acquainted and familiar with the resplendent wooded area that I frequented regularly as a young boy when Aunt Cassandra had been alive. Granted, the trees were much bigger and fuller and far more impressive looking than when I was young. This was the quintessential playground I had played with my water pistol or slingshot as a young boy. Now, as an older man in my early thirties, I was replacing the slingshot and water pistol with a very impressive hunting rifle that would most certainly have bedazzled and beguiled the younger me. I had acquired some hunting training the previous year and was eager to try out my hand as a complete novice in the wooded area on our property. I could feel my heart thumping in my chest with excitement in the anticipation of the hunt. I had erected my own stand on a cedar tree that I felt would be a prime location to sit and wait for a good stag to hunt. The trouble is, I had that stand personally made for me, and I ensured it was very comfortable and luxurious, shall we say, because I'm big on my creature comforts, and I can't really apologise for that. The previous summer I had gained some training from a hunting enthusiast, and I fancied doing some hunting all on my own. The wooded area branches out quite significantly into a large sweep of publicly owned land that looks like an extension of our own property, as the owners have failed to fence in the dividing perimeters, which means we have had hikers trailing across our property quite frequently. It's exquisitely beautiful and like a blissful verdant sanctuary full of Douglas firs, ponderosa pines, western hemlocks, red maples and spruce trees. As I entered the pristine forest, the buzzers, the tweets, the warbles and trills were very pleasing to my ears. I climbed into my stand and began to wait. I was waiting an awfully long time. I became increasingly frustrated, pondering whether I was cut out of the right cloth to be a hunter. The waiting bothered me. I will admit that the heartbeat of the forest and the energy of the trees was very relaxing. I'm very embarrassed to have to admit this and I truly hope that this has happened to other hunters other than myself and not exclusively to me. But I closed my eyes for a second and then I fell asleep. When I awoke up, it was late afternoon, early evening, and I had not intended to be out here for this long. I must have been asleep for many hours, and to my horror, my rifle had fallen off my tree stand and was lying on the ground beneath me, buried beneath the pine needles. A couple of very large stag deers were eating some of the apples and corn I dropped around the tree, but my rifle was now on the ground. If I tried to extract it from the ground, the deer would inevitably scuttle away. I was really mad at myself for having fallen asleep. Suddenly the two stags became anxious and afraid, their ears perked up quickly. They had heard or sensed something, 
and they quickly leapt away. Then the forest became soundless and disturbingly quiet. Something was coming towards me that sounded like a large sack of potatoes dropping on the ground every few seconds. And then I saw the creature that I now know to be a Bigfoot. Nothing prepares you for seeing something as massive as a Bigfoot. King Kong, here we come. That is how intimidating and impressive the Bigfoot was. His body was built for power and efficiency, like a streamlined machine. I would describe him as being so incredibly human, only much bigger than a human being, and covered in dark hair with auburn and golden tones that rather remind me of the tones of a German shepherd. I watched the creature collecting pine needles on the ground and gathering them together in a large mound. Then he crushed the needles under his feet with twisting movements, using his feet like a pestle and mortar, as if he was stamping grapes or herbs, turning them into a pulp with very little difficulty at all. And then, to my amazement, he began to rub the natural oil of pine all over his body, over his long arms and his muscular legs. The creature then glided past me, and I could smell the intoxicating, woody, citrusly smell of pine enveloping the air, and it was a magnificent infusion, although why he did that, I don't know. I'm glad the creature did not see me, because I would have been very scared to have a one-on-one -on -one encounter with him. But I'm willing to bet that he had a friendship with Cassandra, who never shared her Bigfoot secret with me. From time to time we have our washing collected for us from the line, and the occasional berries delivered to our front doorstep. I think the creature is doing this to honour the memory of Cassandra. Not for us, but for her. So there you are. That's my story. Well, hello there. I hope you enjoyed the Omnibus edition. We've got many more coming our, our way for you to listen to. Sending you love wherever you are in the world, in North America, Canada, Kenya, wherever you may be, I send you lots and lots of love. Thank you for listening to my Omnibus, and I really do hope you enjoyed it, because that's the whole idea about it, is to give you some interesting stories to listen to. So until next time... Goodbye and good night.